Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Stand in front of a mirror, shut off the lights, spin around, chant her name three times and prepare for the scare of your life. Some say that this terrifying spirit called forth is that of Queen Mary I. Others believe that the ghost is that of Mary Worth. No matter, from one generation to the next, thrill-seeking boys and girls have passed down the legend of Bloody Mary. Some claim the bloodied woman merely appears in the reflective surface, while others purport she'll claw at your face, haunt you for life, or even kill you. Perhaps you even took on the hair-raising challenge as an adolescent, only to run away from the mirror and out of the room, screaming before the evil spirit had a chance to appear. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… Was the Titanic swapped with its sister ship, the Olympic, as part of an insurance scam? A U.S. veteran is so desperate for financial relief, he turns to a witch's very dark solution. Mobsters gun down one of their own in order to save an enemy. But why? A tragic figure in Mexican folklore, she wears white and wanders the waterside in profound grief. Her name is La Llorona, the Weeping Woman. They say if you chant her name three times, a bloodied face will appear. I speak, of course, of Bloody Mary. We'll look first at the legend, and then at some first-hand experiences that may have you believing the legend is real. Plus. I'll share an amazing creepypasta story called Redemption. If you're new here, welcome to the show. And if you're already a member of this weirdo family, please take a moment and invite someone else to listen. Recommending Weird Darkness to others helps make it possible for me to keep doing the show. And while you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com where you can find the show on Facebook and Twitter, and you can also join the Weird Darkness Weirdos Facebook group. Now, bolt your doors. Lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. Long before the malevolent Bloody Mary came to haunt the living, the original ritual held roots in a young woman's coming of age. Hundreds of years ago, pubescent girls curious about their destined true love would walk backwards up a flight of stairs, then peer into a mirror in a darkened room while holding a candle. This was said to reveal the face of their future husband. Sometimes, however, a skull materialized, signifying death before getting a chance to marry. A scientific explanation for such visions highlights the hallucinations that inevitably set in after prolonged periods of gazing into a mirror under poor lighting. Often these images appear to contort or melt away. It's no wonder, then, that the matrimonial mirror ritual eventually took a turn for the sinister. As time passed, the dark legend of Bloody Mary replaced the adolescent search for true love. 
it transformed into a test of fear for boys and girls, a party game with dire consequences. The identity of the actual woman known as Bloody Mary is difficult to pinpoint. There are several women through the ages that have been associated with the legend. The most famous is Mary, Queen of England, a Roman Catholic ruler from the 16th century who was feared throughout the land for her persecution of Protestants, often burning them at the stake for the crime of their religion. A variation on the ritual involved chanting, I stole your baby, Bloody Mary, in reference to the Queen's failed attempts at bearing an heir. Another Bloody Mary was the vampiric Elizabeth Bathory, which we spoke of in a recent podcast, The Blood Countess, in 16th century Hungary. Elizabeth tortured, mutilated, and murdered young virgins and even drank their blood in a maniac quest to stay youthful. A more recent iteration of Bloody Mary belongs to a dark moment in American history. The Salem witch trial hysteria of the 17th century stoked fear and superstition throughout New England. Children of the era chanted, I believe in Mary Worth, in reference to a supposed practitioner of the dark arts who was burned alive for being a witch. Little, if any, proof exists to confirm Mary Worth's existence. In fact, her backstory received an update during the 20th century. Many will now tell you that Mary Worth was a beautiful woman who died in a car accident, her face severely disfigured and bloodied. When summoned, she appears to the conjurer dressed in all white, with blood dripping down her face. Hollywood also grabbed hold of the legend and turned it into a male character for the 1992 film Candyman. Chanting his name into a mirror summed the sinister spirit who would rip you to pieces with his hook hand. Clearly, the ritual of Bloody Mary refuses to die. We're waiting with bated breath to see what modern-day apparition will next appear from the other side of the mirror. Perhaps you don't believe the legend itself understandable, but then try to explain the following first-hand real-life accounts of encounters with Bloody Mary herself. Marissa and her friend had just finished watching an eerie episode of Ghost Whisperer, and Marissa wanted to scare her friend, one of her favorite activities. So Marissa looked into her living room mirror, spun three times, saying Bloody Mary, and no ghost appeared so she went to the bathroom to try again. Against the warning of her friend, Marissa shut off the lights, closed the door, and repeated the chant. When she looked into the mirror this time, there was still nothing. Disappointed, she was about to flip on the light when she caught a glimpse of something. She looked closer and discovered a black and white woman with her mouth open wide. Marissa expected a scream from the apparition but only found dead, terrifying silence. The woman in the mirror lifted her arms and Marissa saw that her hands were bright red, not with polish, but with blood. Her fingernails had been torn off. Hands reached out from behind Marissa and grabbed her shoulders. Marissa screamed, turned on the light, and ran from the bathroom. Katie was only nine years old when she and her friends decided to attempt Bloody Mary at her house one weekend. The five friends carefully carried candles to the bathroom and began chanting Bloody Mary. As they chanted, an old woman with cuts across her face and chains around her neck and shoulders appeared in the mirror. Suddenly, the shower curtain went up in flames and the girls fled the bathroom. An older boy ran in and put out the fire. Although the girls were blamed for the curtain catching fire, they and their candles were much too far away to have caused it. Twenty-five years later, Katie has never been tempted to try calling Bloody Mary again. While friends Sarah, Gail, and Missy hung out on Friday the 13th, they got to talking about Bloody Mary. The girls had been reading about her on the internet and decided to try the ritual for themselves. The trio got several candles and set them up in Gail's bathroom. 
They waited until 2.55 a.m., then went into the bathroom and chanted Bloody Mary 13 times. As soon as she had been called 13 times, Bloody Mary appeared in swirling smoke in the mirror. All three girls screamed and turned on the light, only for Bloody Mary to vanish immediately. A group of girls were spending the summer at a camp in the Pacific Northwest on an island called Anacortes. Sick of exploring the woods, they decided to collectively fake food poisoning. They ran to a bathroom and shut themselves up in it, hoping to make the fakery convincing. While they were in there, one girl, Jessica, came up with the idea to play Bloody Mary to pass away the time. The rest of the group agreed, and they shut off the lights. They said Bloody Mary three times into the mirror and waited. At first, there was nothing. Then the mirror cracked. All the girls ran off screaming, except for one. The remaining camper was paralyzed with fear. She stared and saw a flash of movement behind the mirror as if someone was standing right behind her. She turned and ran from the bathroom. The next morning, the girls laughed about the event if only to hide how scared they had been. One night, Kelsey's friend had a slumber party. The girls dared one of their crew to try calling Bloody Mary in the bathroom. The friend accepted, glibly confident that the supposed ghost could do her no harm. Fifteen minutes passed as the other girls waited for something to happen but there were no signs of Bloody Mary to be found. Then they heard the girl scream. She tried to get out of the bathroom and was stuck, even though the door didn't have a lock on it. When Kelsey and her friends finally got the girl out, she was crying and whimpering. She showed the girls her arms. They were covered in scars that had never been there before. To this day, Kelsey has not been able to get her friend to speak of what happened to her that night. In April of 2007, the 13th fell on a Friday. On that fateful night, Ezzy and her friends decided to try summoning Bloody Mary. They sat in a circle and called for the spirit, with a coin nearby to communicate. First, they asked that Bloody Mary show a sign that she was there. When they flipped the coin for an answer, they first received a no, but the following two times were yes. They were playing a CD at the time, and it got scratchy, despite the fact that the CD was brand new with no marks on it. Then the girls began feeling dizzy and faint as they felt long fingernails brushing against their backs and faces. The blinds started shaking, although the window wasn't open. As he jumped up and closed the circle between the girls and Bloody Mary, they were all utterly shaken. To this day, as he still has the feeling that she is never truly alone. Lauren and her friend were in an experimental mood the night they decided to try calling Bloody Mary. While out on the road, they stopped at a gas station with an outdoor restroom. They went in, turned off the lights, splashed water onto the mirror, and spun around saying Bloody Mary three times. Lauren's friend, flushed the toilet while Lauren stared into the mirror. What little of her reflection she could make out started turning red. She kept staring, then her friends started screaming and they ran out the door. Outside, Lauren's friends discovered that her face didn't just appear red. It was covered in blood. When they cleaned her face, they discovered tiny scratch marks, like fingernail scratches, all over her face. 29-year-old Amanda has a particularly dramatic tale of Bloody Mary. When she was only 12, Amanda believes that her summoning of the spirit opened a portal that allowed demons and witchcraft into her soul. All these years later, she has become addicted to drugs, has postpartum psychosis, was institutionalized for a month, and has suffered from extreme mental issues constantly. Amanda has even resorted to exorcisms without success. 
firmly believing that her young foolhardiness is responsible for her current problems. So let Amanda's story remind you that summoning ghosts is no laughing business. She has spent her life warning others of the danger of even seemingly innocent childhood games. Up next, was the Titanic swapped with its sister ship the Olympic as part of an insurance scam? Is it possible the Titanic never really did sink? This story and more when Weird Darkness returns. About a year ago, I began getting tons of notifications about how somebody was trying to log into my social media. I was getting email phishing scams on a daily basis. I was being inundated with email sales pitches from companies I'd never even heard of. I was getting calls and texts from those same companies. I was listening to a podcast that talked about Incogni, short for incognito, and I thought I'd give it a try. For the past year, Incogni has reduced the number of email and spam calls and texts that I receive, it's helped to protect my identity from hackers, and helps keep my data safe. Over the past year, Incogni has successfully removed my personal information from over 200 different data brokerage sites, and I get regular updates on how many are still in progress, how many have been successfully completed, and how many requests were sent out to remove my personal information. It would have taken me over 160 hours to do all of this, and nobody has time or patience for that. Fortunately, it's all taken care of by Incogni. I live online, personally and professionally, and I trust Incogni to help me live with a lot less worry. You can give Incogni a try right now by visiting WeirdDarkness.com slash Incogni. That's short for incognito. I-N-C-O-G-N-I. WeirdDarkness.com slash Incogni. It's an historical irony that the most famous ship to ever sail was famous because it sank, but that was the case with the RMS Titanic. Then the world's largest and most luxurious cruise liner, it hit an iceberg on its maiden voyage early on the morning of the 15th of April, 1912. Within three hours, it had sunk to the bottom of the ocean killing 1,500 of the ship's 2,224 passengers and crew. Titanic was one of the three Olympic-class ocean liners built at the Harland & Wolff shipyards in Belfast, the other two being the RMS Britannic and the RMS Olympic. The Olympic was launched a year before the Titanic but seemed to share its more famous sister ship's poor luck. Within months of its launch in 1911, it had two serious collisions, the second with Royal Navy cruiser HMS Hawk off the coast of the Isle of Wight, causing serious structural damage to the Olympic's keel and steel beams. Some authors have suggested that the damage to the Olympic was more serious than admitted. In fact, it was virtually a write-off. Repairs would be ruinously expensive, running into millions of pounds. The already troubled White Star Line was facing a potential financial disaster. Could White Star and its owner, J.P. Morgan, have devised an audacious insurance scam to try and salvage their investment in the troubled Olympic line? The Olympic, the theory goes, would be swapped with the Titanic and sunk in a staged accident. The Titanic, now disguised as the Olympic, would then carry on in service. The two ships were essentially identical, save for minor differences, and were moored side by side in dry dock. The swap would entail nothing more elaborate than swapping a few nameplates and plaques. Although not a new theory, Robin Gardner popularized the insurance swap theory in his 1998 book, Titanic – The Ship That Never Sank. Could it really have been the Olympic that sank in the Titanic's place? 
Proponents of the swap theory have pointed out disparities in the number of portholes on the ships. The Olympic had 16, the Titanic had 14. Photographs taken of the Titanic in dry dock show it with 14 portholes, but by the time of its doomed maiden voyage, it now had 16, just like the Olympic. Was this evidence that the ships had been swapped, or just that they had added two extra portholes as part of an aesthetic change to the Titanic? Other evidence supports the switch. The windows on the Olympic were somewhat unevenly spaced, but more evenly spaced on the Titanic. Again, by the time of its maiden voyage, the Titanic had acquired unevenly spaced windows, like the Olympic. The damage to the Olympic after its collision with the Hawk lent it a noticeable and permanent two-degree list to port. The undamaged Titanic had no such list. However, one second-class passenger who survived the sinking, Lawrence Beasley, later reported the Titanic did in fact list to port, stating the Titanic listed to port, it was plain she did so, for the skyline and sea on the port side were visible most of the time and on the starboard only sky. Beasley, a science teacher, was considered a reliable observer and would later write one of the first books about the Titanic disaster. There was a nationwide coal strike during the launch of the Titanic, leading to thousands of firemen, boiler stokers, and greasers short of work. Yet despite this, the Titanic struggled to find a crew, with many men refusing to work on the ship at any price. Rumors were circulating amongst the workers at Harland and Wolf that the ships had been swapped as part of an insurance scam and the Titanic was to be sunk. Did foreknowledge of the sinking of the Titanic frighten men off from wanting to work on the ship? Despite the immense fanfare and hype that surrounded the Titanic launch, it was only just over half full when it left Southampton on its doomed voyage. Did White Star want to minimize the number of passengers because it intended to scuttle the ship? Or had the rumors of the insurance scam spread outside of the shipyards? Several last-minute cancellations from high-profile passengers certainly suggest some kind of foreknowledge. Many of the richest and most prestigious names in the early 20th century society were booked onto the Titanic. J.P. Morgan, the international financier who owned the White Star's parent company, was due to travel on the Titanic, but canceled his trip a few days before the departure, claiming illness. A New York Times reporter discovered this to be a lie. Morgan was actually seen perfectly well with his mistress in France on the very day Titanic sank. Industrialist Henry Clay Frick and his wife, banker Horace J. Harding and billionaire George Washington Vanderbilt, all connected to J.P. Morgan, were amongst several other prominent figures who canceled at the last minute. The SS Californian, also owned by J.P. Morgan, was a large passenger ship that was ultimately blamed for the loss of life on the Titanic. It behaved somewhat oddly around the time of the Titanic's voyage. Carrying no passengers, it steamed into the middle of the Atlantic, stopped, and waited. Its only cargo was 3,000 woolen blankets and jumpers. What was the purpose behind this curious maneuver? Was the Californian intended to rescue the Titanic's passengers after the Titanic's deliberate sinking? Edith Russell, a survivor of the sinking, was adamant that Titanic officers assured her the Californian was on its way. Author Robin Gardner suggests serious navigation errors led to the Californian stopping in the wrong area, some 12 miles away from the Titanic. With the Californian unable to complete its rescue mission, the Titanic was doomed and some 1,500 passengers and crew perished in one of the worst maritime disasters in modern history. The wreck of the Titanic was discovered by Robert Ballard in 1985. Some evidence from the wreck supports the switch theory. The stamp 401, the ID number used for the Titanic at Harland and Wolf, can be seen on the Titanic's propeller. However, some authors have suggested that the Titanic propeller was fitted to the Olympic during its repair following the collision with the Hawk. If true, 
this would be strong evidence that the vessel on the ocean floor was really the Olympic. What appears to be the letters M and P can also be seen on the side of the wreck. Could that be the remains of the ship's original etched nameplate, Olympic, covered over with the Titanic's as part of the scam? The wreck appears to show some evidence of the gray paint used as an undercoat on the Olympic. The Titanic used black paint for its undercoat. Insurance scams and maritime fraud were common at the time of the Titanic's sinking. Whilst it seems unlikely such a scam could be pulled off today, the lack of media coverage in 1912 makes it a lot more credible. Only one film survives of the Titanic and the photo record is also scant. With the two ships extremely similar, it's argued that only the most eagle-eyed would have spotted the swap. Whilst the wreck of the Titanic, found in 1985, provided some evidence in favor of the swap theory, more emerged that suggest the ship found at the bottom of the Atlantic really was the Titanic. The Titanic's identification number, 401, is stamped in multiple places on the wreck and on furniture and other artifacts found by salvagers. Could the swap really have been so elaborate to include swapping furniture and decor between the two ships? Titanic scholars and historians say the proponents of the insurance swap theory have overstated how similar the two ships were. Whilst superficially alike, there were several important structural differences, as well as aesthetic changes made to Titanic to distinguish it from its sister. The first Class A deck on Titanic was enclosed in a glass screen, but was open on the Olympic. Titanic's wheelhouse was flat at the front and the Olympics curved. Olympic's B deck had a first class promenade, whereas Titanic had private verandas and suites. Indeed, many passengers were booked into the suites, an impossibility if the ship was really the Olympic. Many skeptics of the insurance swap theory have pointed out that even if an insurance scam made financial sense to the White Star Line, the loss of reputation they would suffer if one of their vessels sunk would be devastating. Losing the Titanic on its maiden voyage would be a public disaster for White Star and lead to a loss of confidence in the company amongst passengers. The intention behind the Olympic-class liners was to attract rich first-class passengers and offer them the finest in luxury and opulence. With image paramount, a sinking would prove to be a catastrophe for the company. The Titanic was infamously described as unsinkable. Whilst this proved to be incorrect, of course, only a freak set of circumstances managed to sink it. Could plotters really have engineered something so complex as the sinking of the world's largest vessel in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean? With so many variables and so many things that could go wrong, how could they be sure they would succeed? If their plan was discovered, the consequences would have been dire. The perpetrators would be blamed for the deaths of 1,500 people, perhaps charged with their murders. Would the likes of White Line and J.P. Morgan, a billionaire who could afford any potential losses on the Olympic, really risk the gallows for an insurance scam? The Olympic, or if the insurance swap theory is true, the Titanic disguised as the Olympic, continued to serve for many years. It acted as troop transport in World War I and resumed service as a luxury liner in the 20s and 30s before being finally retired in 1935. In all of that time, no evidence that the ship was really the Titanic was ever discovered. Even when it was dismantled in 1936, there was no indication that the ship was anything other than the Olympic. When Weird Darkness returns, a U.S. veteran is so desperate for financial relief he turns to a witch's very dark solution. Mobsters gun down one of their own in order to save an enemy. And a tragic figure in Mexican folklore, she wears white and wanders the waterside in profound grief. Her name is La Llorona. These stories are up next.
No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee – fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. This story is about me and my brother Cam. I'm Chris. This happened in late June of 2017. I'm a Marine Corps veteran, and majority of my finances come from the VA. During the summer, the school I attended refused to process my enrollment to the VA and I couldn't afford to pay out of pocket. At that time, I couldn't go to school nor receive the money that I needed for school. At that moment, I was facing an eviction from my apartment complex. At this time, I grew desperate and sought out multiple ways to get money. Someone I knew told me that if I made a deal with a demon, I may get exactly what I needed. I used to be religious and used to never trust anything concerning demons, but at this point I no longer cared. I did my research and even spoke to a Wiccan who have made deals with demons before. She told me everything I needed to know. Late one night, during the full moon, I purchased everything I needed and went to my house to prepare. My brother was curious to do it too, but was skeptical, so I went first. I wrote down the deal with the demon I was told is known for finances. After not liking the deal, I threw it away and wrote a new one. Afterwards, I went into my room with all lights off and conducted the ceremony. After waiting for a while, there was nothing that went on and I gave up. I came out of the room only to see Cam looking frightened. He said while I was in the room, he had heard strange noises coming from the door. I hadn't heard anything while being in there. Cam was too afraid to go through with it after that. Afterwards, I took my current deal and threw it away, along with the candles and symbol of the demon that I wanted to contact. The next day, after leaving my part-time job and picking Cam up from his, we went home to something quite strange. The first offer that I threw away in the trash was found on my windowsill. On it had a small, bloody handprint. Cam asked if I took it out, and I said no. We were both frightened. To make things stranger, when the AC broke in our apartment, only my room was ice cold. On days, Cam would be home. He would hear voices asking who he is and what he wants. This carried on for two weeks. It was to the point we were both terrified. I found both deals I made, ripped them up, and tossed them in the dumpster. After three more days, my room was still ice cold, and I chose to stay in the living room with Cam. By the time we moved out, the room was no longer cold, and everything was back to normal. On October 23, 1935, mobster Dutch Schultz was gunned down at the old Palace Chop House in Newark, New Jersey. Dutch's death was a strange one because it was carried out by other mobsters. But that's not the part that was so strange. 
his former allies killed him to save the life of the man who was perhaps their greatest enemy, Special Prosecutor Thomas Dewey. Schultz, whose real name was Arthur Flegenheimer, was born and raised in the Bronx. He had a minor record until the 1920s when he began learning the business as one of the many protégés of Arnold Rothstein. Schultz soon ran a gang that took over most of the beer trade in the Bronx. He had a reputation for being tough and mean, although a little on the strange side and also had a keen eye for potential new sources for racket revenues. Schultz saw enormous potential offered by the Penny Annie numbers in Harlem, and he moved in aggressively on the independent African-American operators that were there. Using unremitting violence, he turned them into his agents and turned the numbers racket into an operation that grossed almost $20 million annually. Using a mathematical genius named Otto Berman, he figured out a way to doctor the results of the numbers game so that the smallest possible payout was made. Schultz was almost universally disliked. Not even his own men liked or respected him, but they did fear him. Schultz had the lowest payroll of any gangster in the city and flew into a rage if any of his gunmen dared ask for a raise. Only Otto Berman made big money, ranking in $10,000 a week. Money was everything to Schultz. As his attorney, Dixie Davis, once said of him, you can insult Arthur's girl, spit in his face, push him around, and he'll laugh, but don't steal a dollar from his accounts. If you do, you're dead. Among those who thought to have stolen from Schultz and died for it was the homicidal John Legs Diamond, who was rubbed out in an upstate New York hotel in 1931. He also fought an all-out war with Vincent Mad Dog Cole, a former underling who tried to take over Schultz's business. On February 8, 1932, Cole was machine-gunned to death in a telephone booth by some of Schultz's gunmen. Schultz was a useful tool of the National Crime Syndicate, started by Charles Lucky Luciano, Meyer Lansky, and others, but they knew he was erratic and that sooner or later he would become too big of a risk to live. Schultz went to prison on tax evasion charges and while away, Meyer Lansky and mobster Bo Weinberg took over his rackets. Then, unbelievably, Schultz beat the rap and came back to claim his operation. Lansky, wanting to avoid more bloodshed, insisted that he had just been minding the store for Schultz until the trial ended. Schultz overlooked Lansky's betrayal, but Weinberg disappeared a short time later and was never seen again. Before any further decisions had to be made about the fate of Dutch Schultz, the law intervened once more. This time it was in the form of Special Prosecutor Thomas E. Dewey, who in his war on vice and racketeering turned his main focus on Schultz in 1935. Dewey had been appointed to his position by New York Governor Herbert Lehman to look into organized crime in New York. The first of three inquiries into police corruption and political racketeering had started in 1930. The public was appalled by the web of corruption that existed at almost every level of city government. The news broke that Democrat Party officials had used a $10 million depression relief fund for their own uses. The sheriff of New York County and other officials were involved in illegal gambling operations and that graft governed the granting of city permits, franchises, and leases. Dewey extended the parameters of the investigation to known racketeers, including some of the most prominent names in organized crime. He won 72 out of 73 convictions, and eventually his successful investigations led to his appointment as district attorney in 1937. Dewey went on to become governor of New York State, and he ran twice for U.S. president, losing in 1944 and 1948. Before all of this, however, he owed his life, even though he never knew it, to Charles Lucky Luciano. Thanks to Dewey's attention to Schultz, the mobster saw his operations halted and his revenues decreased. In 1935, Dewey confiscated thousands of Schultz's slot machines and publicly smashed them. Schultz had one solution to his new problem – kill Dewey. 
Schultz went to the syndicate, asked for permission to have the special prosecutor taken out, but his demand was refused. Luciano explained that the heat that would be generated by Dewey's murder could permanently damage the syndicate's operations. Schultz stormed out of the meeting, swearing that he would kill Dewey himself. It would be Schultz's murderous nature and his refusal to listen to reason that would get him killed. Luciano had to get rid of Dutch, and after a meeting with Lansky and others, Schultz's fate was sealed. On October 23, 1935, Schultz, Otto Berman, and two gunmen, Lulu Rosencrantz and Abe Landau, were having dinner at one of Schultz's favorite hangouts, the Palace Chop House and Tavern in Newark, New Jersey. Schultz got up from the table and went to the bathroom. While he was in there, two gunmen, Charles Workman and Emanuel Weiss, entered the restaurant. On their way in, one of them checked the men's room and, seeing a man at the urinal, shot him. He had no idea who the man was. His back was to him, but the killer wanted to ensure that the assassins wouldn't be surprised from behind. Moments later, they gunned down the three men at the table. Checking the bodies, they discovered that Schultz was not among them. Remembering the man in the bathroom, they found out that it was Dutch Schultz, shot while in one of the worst positions imaginable. After cleaning the cash out of his pockets, the killers fled the restaurant. Amazingly, the shots had not immediately killed Schultz. Legend has it that he did not want to be found dead in a bathroom, so he staggered back into the dining room and collapsed on one of the tables. He lived for two more days in the hospital, but never named his killers. Thomas Dewey never knew how close he was to death, or that he owed his life to a man whom he later convicted and sent to prison. Lucky Luciano. Patricio Lujan was a young boy in New Mexico in the 1930s when a normal day with his family in Santa Fe was interrupted by the sight of a strange woman near their property. The family watched in curious silence as the tall, thin woman dressed all in white crossed the road near their house without a word and headed for a nearby creek. It wasn't until she got to the water that the family realized something was off. As Luhan tells it, she just seemed to glide as if having no legs before disappearing. After reappearing at a distance far too quickly for any normal woman to have traversed, she disappeared again for good, without leaving a single footprint behind. Luhan was disturbed but knew exactly who the woman had been – La Llorona. The legend of La Llorona translates to the weeping woman and is popular throughout the southwestern United States and Mexico. The tale has various retellings and origins, but always La Llorona is described as a willowy white figure who appears near the water waiting for her children. Mentions of La Llorona can be traced back over four centuries, although the origins of the tale have been lost to time. She's been connected to the Aztecs as one of ten omens predicting the conquest of Mexico or as a fearsome goddess. One such goddess is known as the Snake Woman, who has been described as a savage beast and an evil omen who wears white, walks about at night, and constantly cries. Another goddess is that of the Jade Skirted One, who oversaw the waters and was greatly feared because she allegedly would drown people. In order to honor her, the Aztecs sacrificed children. An entirely different origin story coincides with the arrival of the Spanish in America back in the 16th century. According to this version of the tale, La Llorona was actually La Malinche, a native woman who served as an interpreter, guide, and later mistress to Hernan Cortes during his conquest of Mexico. The conquistador left her after she gave birth and instead married a Spanish woman. Despised now by her own people, it is said that La Malinche 
murdered Cortez's spawn in vengeance. There is no evidence that the historic La Malinche, who did in fact exist, killed her children or was exiled by her people. However, it is possible that the Europeans did bring the seeds of the legend of La Llorona from their homeland. The legend of a vengeful mother who slays her own offspring can be traced all the way back to Medea of Greek mythology, who killed her sons after being betrayed by her husband Jason. The ghostly wails of a woman warning of impending death also share similarities with the Irish banshees. English parents have long used the tale of Jenny Greenteeth, who drags children down into a watery grave to keep adventurous children away from water where they might stumble in. The most popular version of the tale features a stunning young peasant woman named Maria who married a wealthy man. The couple lived happily for a time and had two children together before Maria's husband lost interest in her. One day, while walking by the river with her two children, Maria caught sight of her husband ride by in his carriage, accompanied by a pretty young woman. In a fit of rage, Maria flung her two children into the river and drowned them both. When her anger subsided and she realized what she had done, she succumbed to such profound grief that she spent the rest of her days wailing by the river in search of her children. In another version of the story, Maria cast herself into the river immediately after her children. In yet other versions, Maria was a vain woman who spent her nights reveling in town instead of tending to her children. After one drunken evening, she returned home to find them both drowned. She was cursed for her neglectfulness to search for them in her afterlife. The constants of the legend are always the dead children and a wailing woman, either as a human or ghost. La Llorona is often spotted in white, crying for her children near running water. By some traditions, the ghost of La Llorona is feared. She is said to be vengeful and sees others' children to drown them in place of her own. By other traditions, she is a warning, and those who hear her wails will soon face death themselves. Sometimes she is seen as a disciplinary figure and appears to children who are unkind to their parents. In October 2018, the people who made The Conjuring released a horror film riddled with jump scares, The Curse of La Llorona. The flick is reportedly pretty spooky, though perhaps with this background on the wailing figure, it might be even creepier if you decide to watch it. A lot more Weird Darkness is yet to come, so keep listening. Winter has Louisville in its grip and former FBI agent Dallas Powell has his hands full with car trouble, cat trouble, and trying to keep the Derby City branch of True Blood Investigations and Security, Inc. solvent. When a juicy insurance job comes his way, he jumps at it, but the discovery of a decades-old murder spawns a veritable blizzard of violence, and Dallas finds himself right in its path. Winter Wonderland – A Dallas Powell Mystery by T. Lee Harris narrated by Darren Marlar. Here a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. I work in restoration. Your house or business floods? My crew comes in, dries everything up, cleans the baseboards, preps the place, tosses the ruined stuff into a dumpster, and hauls it away. We leave the place clean and ready for a fresh coat of paint. I'm usually pretty proud of the work me and my crew does. We do it all, too. Mostly we have to do flood damage, but there are times when we get called to rich folks' houses to remove stains from stone and concrete structures. I've had a museum call for the same. I've made a name for myself in being able to get just about any stain out of any stone. You think it's easy? 
or that you can just scrub away a stain, but you know, folks forget that marble is not solid material. It is porous, and it sucks in liquid. That's why polish and maintenance is important. I'm not naive, though. Plenty of times I get called in for red wine. Yeah, okay, I get it. You were partying with the hooker, she OD'd, cracked her coked-out head on a coffee table, and suddenly there's a pool of blood on the marble floor of your penthouse, and you can't get the stain out. Worse, the wife's home next week. I've done the cleanup enough times to know a few things. First, you don't ask stupid questions. Hell, half the time the hooker's fine or would have OD'd anyway with or without the expensive John. So, eh, no skin off my nose. And if you're cleaning up the scene before the cops can show up, honestly, that's on them. I have a job to do, and I do it. And second, don't remember these people. I'm not some guy who's going to get brought in on some indictment hearing or some stupid tabloid media circus, all because I decided to suddenly have a good memory. I do a job like this, I get your address, I show up, I shake your hand, I call you Mr. Smith, and then I leave. I delete your address, and I carry on with my life. The less I know, the safer I am. That being said, I don't get the blood cleanup very often. It's normally innocent stuff. Wine, sewage, blood water, sometimes human feces. You think it's gross, but it's easier than anything else to clean. The weirdest request? I need to give you context on weird. I had a call to clean up a place after something called a Luna party, which somehow involved a whole lot of menstrual blood and dancing in it. Next time, bring a tarp. That's not my weirdest call. It was a Friday. I don't know why that mattered when I got a call. The secretary was out for lunch, as was the rest of the crew. Rather than let it go to voicemail, I took the phone call. This was my first mistake. MNC Restoration, Inc., Fred speaking. Yeah, I'm Fred. There was a pause, then a guy's voice comes over, kind of timid. Yes, hello, I understand from your ad you can remove stains from all sorts of stone. Uh, marble as well? Kind of our specialty, I boast. What sort of stains are you talking about? Uh, blood. I never had somebody just out and say it. I get all the pussyfooting around. Sure, wine, salsa, sangria. Sangria was my favorite, considering that blood is in the name. But this guy just out and said it plainly. Uh, how large an area? Another pause. I'd say about maybe 10,000 square foot. No, 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 not, not the property, I tried to clarify. I, I mean just the stain. Yeah, I know. You need 10,000 square feet of marble, which is stained in blood, cleaned? Yes. This time I had to take a moment. How many gallons was that? I thought back to that lunar party thing or whatever, but even that was only a single floor. I'm sorry, some context is probably needed, the voice on the other end continued. My name is Timothy. I work in antiques. A curator friend of mine referred me to you after you managed to clear her museum steps of some blood that apparently occurred after somebody took a nasty fall. I cleared my throat. Right. Okay, yes, I'm just still trying to process. 10,000 square feet of stained tile? Is it too much? I was still a bit dumbfounded. Let me be frank. The site was the location of a rather bloody massacre some time ago. My colleagues and I have already examined the site in its entirety and we're looking to begin restoration. At this point, my concern got overridden by cash. Antiquities? Historical site? This sounded like a fat government contract. Christmas came early to old Freddy. Uh, what's the budget for this project of yours? Time is more the essence than anything else. We need the site cleaned in preparation for other restoration efforts so as soon as possible would be preferred. Your fee is essentially yours to name. You're literally the only one who I can call on for this task. Haggling was not this guy's strong suit. Sounded to me like he needed to read the book The Art of the Deal. You're talking a whole lot of space to clear. 10,000 square feet is a whole lot of floor. It's not all floor. A good portion of it's on the walls and ceiling. 
Uh, how high is the ceiling? About 50 feet. I was silent again. I was going to need to rent a scissor lift for that. I thought for a moment and cleared my throat. I'm going to need a whole lot of equipment, materials, and at least five guys if you want this job done right and fast. Of course. Uh, how long has the marble been stained? There was a moment of silence. By the current timeline, oh, well, maybe 200. Wait, what's the current year again? I wasn't too sure he was asking, but I figured I shouldn't sound stupid. It's 2018. 350 years, roughly. I thought for a moment, thinking about how, this being the United States, there was no way for there to be a structure like he was talking about. I ignored him and assumed he had to be wrong. Anything over a decade is as set as it's going to be anyway. I took a breath. I can't do it for less than 30 grand. I figured he'd work on needling the price down, but then he shocked me again. Understandable. I'm assuming I could ignore a number of taxes and paperwork if I provide a cash payment. I coughed in shock, nearly swallowed my cigarette. Yes, certainly. Cash? I'm going to have this job done and it was going to be tax-free? I felt like I just won the lotto. So the job itself comes up. I've got my crew rolling to the address. The address has a huge rusted gate chain on the front, typical of a site that you're not allowed to get into. I see a guy standing about six foot in a black trench coat, black sunglasses, gloves, black dress, shoes, and slacks. Brown hair and pretty pale. He doesn't say a word and unlocks the chain on the gate. Pulled it off pretty quick. I thought it was a heavier gauge than he made it seem, but I was probably just mistaken, being in a huge truck and not too close to the gate. The guy opens the gate up and walks up to the side of the truck. Uh, Fred, yes? He says flatly. I nod, reaching my hand out to him. You're Tim? Timothy, yes. He shakes my hand. Firm handshake, and his hair is cut short, trim, proper. Military, I ask? He nods, stepping back and pointing down past the gate, motioning with his non-directing hand to move. Definitely military. So I nod and drive up. I see a huge mansion, white and gray stone steps, old siding falling apart, boarded up windows, messed up the roof, and the entire place looks to be knocked down, but getting rebuilt was apparently on the docket for today, and I was getting paid to not care. As we unload, Timothy opens up the front doors and knocks them in place. He starts talking loudly. The doors need to be open at all times while you work. There is no ventilation inside. He has a pair of pretty heavy-duty door stops on each door. From the outside, I can't see anything inside. Nothing but pitch black. You're going to need lighting, so I hope you brought a generator. I laugh while my crew unloads the truck and sets up two generators, pulling down some cans of gas. This isn't my first rodeo. So it would seem, says Timothy, and then he walks inside and vanishes into the blackness. I motion for the crew to set up the lights, and the first place we go is on either side of the door. He wasn't kidding about needing light. The boards were perfect, and the inside was absolutely dark, like the middle of a moonless night dark. I hear the generator kick on and the lights perk up a second later. That's when I see a massive white face appear out of the dark with brown drips across it. It's an angelic woman carved expertly out of marble. I swear I can see the pores on her cheeks and the split ends of her long hair. There's a second similar statue about 30 feet to the left, and it's covered in brown stains. I hear one of my guys. Chavez, speak up. My God. That's about when I got the hint something wasn't right. Chavez spoke up. Hail Mary, our father protect us. I picked up Chavez from a day laborer site about a year ago. I've been paying him under the table ever since. He's either from Mexico or Honduras. He was a good worker, so I never bothered to care and could never ask. This is too much. This place is cursed to high hell. The blood's all over those angel statues. What is this? Chavez was rambling. You see, the reason I could never ask Chavez where he came from was that Chavez doesn't speak a lick of English. 
Timothy's voice soon echoed across the room. Walking over the solid marble in various states of stains and scrapes, I trust this isn't too much for you and your men. I didn't actually spot where he had come from, but I wasn't paying attention before Chavez got a smack upside the head from one of my full-timers, Pete. Since when the hell can you speak English, Chavez? When the hell did you learn Spanish, Peter? Chavez asked. Timothy seemed agitated. Gentlemen, if we can begin the job now. And he walked past us and outside. I turned to both of my men. Pete, Chavez, shut up, both of you. We do this job, go home, y'all get a good paycheck, okay? No more questions, let's get moving. This place is cursed, Chavez said, before turning around and pulling in the pressure washers and detergent bottles. I got up in Chavez's face now, certain he can understand me. Then the quicker we get started, the quicker we can get the hell out of here, understand? Understood, Chavez said, still looking confused. Peter then spoke up. Hey, boss. He focused a flashlight to a portion of the floor where the stain ended. I looked over to where he was shining the light. The brown stains were everywhere, as described, but toward where one large swath of brown ended was an impression on the floor in the stuff much clearer. The impression was of a sword, which had to have been drenched in blood. The sword-shaped stain didn't bother me, it was what was apparently holding it, an outstretched arm shape, and then two massive wing-like stains on either side with a human-like face profiled on the floor. Everything below the waist of the figure vanished in the larger stain across the floor. We each had an idea of what we were looking at, but we were too stunned at the sight. Chavez was the first to break the silence. Angels died here. Part 2 to this creepypasta restoration is up next on Weird Darkness. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. Part 2 I heard what Chavez said, but I don't think I was letting it sink in. Angels don't die. <laughs> angels don't exist, personally, but that's neither here nor there. If angels existed, I'd have seen a miracle or two around my house by now. My mother was a god nut, super religious, yet nothing saved her from her car accident or stopped my father's cancer. Now, there's some rational explanation. I know there is. The imprint on the floor, sure, it could be human. Timothy said this was a massacre over 300 years ago. So some guy died in a pool of his own blood, sword in hand, and the rest pooled in the shape of wings. No, no, couldn't be wings. This was kind of a Rorschach test. Somebody sees puppy clouds, Chavez sees wings because they're two giant 30-foot statues of angels flanking the center of the damn room. It's in his head, that's all. I get a hold of myself. Chavez, Pete, get the scissors lift in here. Help out Bob and Mike and let's get this job over with. Sooner we start, sooner we're done. Chop, chop. Pete gets motivated pretty quick. But Chavez is now on one knee. 
making the cross over his chest and saying the Lord's Prayer. I ignore him for now and get to busying myself with the task at hand. The most difficult problem first. The statue on the left needs to be cleaned, and carefully, since it's a work of art. As Bob and I are guiding the scissor lift into the place, I hear Timothy shout something at Chavez. I rush over. Now I feel like I'm on a normal work site. Hey, hey, don't shout at my guys. What's going on? I intervene. Chavez has both of his hands up, stepping back from a huge structure of canvas and plywood, making up a barricade to the right side of the entrance. I was just checking for more stains, Fred. Understanding Chavez is a new thing for me, but it's not entirely unwelcome. Timothy seems exasperated. I appreciate your due diligence, but this this area is unstable. I cannot have anyone past these barriers. I apologize. I should have made that clear. The main hall is where the cleaning must be done. Only the main hall. Any area that's barricaded is unsafe. I can't be held liable for the safety of your men if they wander past them. I looked to Chavez. You heard the man. Help Bob with the scissor lift and then get to pre-treating the statue. Be careful, okay? Chavez nods and looks to Timothy. What saint is he? Timothy looks at the statue for a moment and gets this kind of faraway look in his eyes. Dinah of Enoch. Chavez gives Timothy thumbs up and says, I'll take good care of St. Dinah. She will sparkle. He runs off to help Bob with the scissor lift, and a very confused Bob and Chavez make their way over to the statue of Dinah, I guess. Timothy is smiling an odd kind of smile, and I almost break my no-questions rule for a moment. I get my hard hat on and start shouting at Bob when I see he's not wearing a harness on the lift. Typical worksite stuff. Gotta remind the old-timers they're mortal and make sure the greenhorn of the group doesn't mess something up. I'm happy to slide back into my routine. It wouldn't last, of course. About halfway through the day, we're just about done getting the bust of this statue clear, and I gotta say, she's looking as good as new there when we hear a big bang. It sounds almost like somebody took a large aluminum pipe and smashed it down onto the marble. It echoes over our tools, and even the guys with ear protection are taken back by the sound. I scream and shout to cut the equipment and tell Bob and Chavez to get off the scissor lift. Lord knows if something blew on that thing. It's a rental, after all. I call Mike over to have a look. Mike slides under the lift as Bob and Chavez unhook their harnesses. Chavez looks to me. It wasn't the lift, boss. Well, then what was it? Chavez points to behind one of the barricades, and I spot Timothy running towards it. I think I hear him mumble something like, this can't be happening right now. I shout to him, hey, Tim, you need a hand? Timothy shoots me a stern look, and in a pretty practiced officer tone commands, no one is to go beyond this point. Something may have collapsed. If there's an issue, I'll let you know. You stay there, and disappears behind a piece of plywood and canvas. I look to my guys and tell them to continue to inspect the scissor lift and then get back to work as if everything's okay. God only knows what compelled me to walk toward the barricade at that moment. Morbid curiosity, perhaps? A lapse of sound judgment? <laughs> A mini-stroke? Still not sure to this day, but man, was this at least the third or fourth stupidest thing I did that day. I just get close enough to hear voices. There's a woman on the other side and Timothy. I'm sorry, I truly am, but I'm afraid they're all gone, I hear Timothy say, hushed but still enough for me to hear. I know your pilgrimage must have been arduous. The female voice sounds frantic and heartbroken. But that can't be. Surely this cannot be. Who would do such a thing? Who could? Was it an army? It was just two people, unfortunately. He sounded almost guilty. They seemed to come in relative peace, but it was soon apparent that at least one of them had other ideas. All thought valiantly, but they couldn't be stopped. The woman's voice is trembling. It was her, wasn't it? The daughter of Lu... The pressure washer kicked in and startled me while drowning them both out, and I realized how close I was to the barricade, trying to listen. I stepped back and made my way quickly to the rest of the group, keeping an eye on the far barricade Timothy had vanished behind. 
I don't see Tim emerge till we're just about done for the day. The statue clean. Timothy stops as he sees it, in reverence of some kind, I guess, looking it over silently. I walk over to him. So far, so good. We should be able to get some pre-treatment on the flooring, let it sit overnight, then we'll hit hard tomorrow. Timothy just nods. Your men do swift work. That's what we do, I say proudly. Pete starts yelling for me from across the room. I excuse myself and hustle over. What's up? I look at where Pete is, and he just points down. There, for lack of a better word, a gash in the flooring. I need to explain why this floor is unusual, more so than just having blood all over it and more than the shapes in said blood. You see, this floor doesn't have seams. It's one solid chunk of marble. I've seen some expensive walls and floors that are huge slabs, sure. Happens all the time. You have enough money, they'll tow a mountain to your house. But this was a mansion worth of floor that for the life of me, I could not find a damn seam in. Now, the gash, it's almost ten feet long, and at the center, it looks almost six inches deep. Even with the light, while I can see the bottom, it looks pretty dark inside the gash. Pete looks to me. I'm going to ignore how this got here and just ask what we're supposed to do. The surface scratches are easy to buff out, but this is not going to buff out easy. I call Mike over to have a look. Mike looks it over and runs his hand over the edges of the opening as well as the sides. It's all stained, of course. Jesus. He stands up and looks it over. That is one clean swipe. There are no cutting marks like you'd get if you were slicing into it with a floor cutter, so... Uh... He starts thinking. Can toss in quick set to fill it. Get it uh, most of the way full anyway, and we could just toss on some filler and polish, but... I think we can do better with some resin. Make it look a bit more natural. It's up to the client, though. This is going to cost extra. I look it over. A two-inch wide, ten-foot-long, and six-inch deep slash in the marble. Certainly wasn't in the order. I look to see Timothy is already approaching us. Just the man I need to see. Timothy looks down and shakes his head. She did some serious damage. Don't ask, don't ask, just don't. I keep saying that in my head. Uh, we can fill it and get it level. May even make it look pretty, but this wasn't in the original quote, so I'd say about another four grand. I feel bad if this entire job didn't feel like some crazy funhouse. Timothy just nods. Fine, fine, don't go crazy, just so it's level and no one trips over it. Mike heads out to get the materials we need, and I drag one of the sandblasters over. The gash is smooth, and it'll need to be rougher if that quick set's going to fill it in right. Everyone gets to work while I start to blast into this thing. And then something black shoots straight up out of the gash and clatters somewhere behind me. This is why I wear a hard hat, folks. I cut the blaster and look around. It doesn't seem like anyone else heard anything. I look to what popped out of the gash and realize the gash is about nine inches deeper now, and I can see it's still solid marble, no subfloor or dirt. Nothing is behind me but my closed toolbox. Whatever popped up must have shattered when it hit the ground, or all I saw was sand and blood popping up out of the gash in the floor. I get my ear protection back on and finish up prepping the gash to be filled. We pack up for the day. The floor is pre-treated, we store the tools and such inside, and I do a quick head count. And I notice I'm short one Honduran. Oh, yeah, mystery solved on that one. Chavez is from Honduras. I look around and then spot him coming out from behind the barrier. Timothy walking behind him, his hand on his shoulder. Crap. I run over. Chavez, what the hell? You were told not to... Sorry, boss, won't happen again. He's very quiet and looks to Timothy. Uh, please consider, I, I do not mind. It's dangerous, Jorge, Timothy says. Discuss with me later, yes? Chavez just nods and walks off. What was that about? I ask. Timothy just walks past me. I thought you didn't ask questions. Well, not what it involves one of my guys. I clear my throat. 
who, I'm sorry, disobeyed your instructions. Timothy glanced back at me, and with the light from the door behind him, I kind of got the best look at his ice-blue eyes. Ensure it doesn't happen again, Fred. I just nod dumbly as the red flags keep waving in my head. Just don't show up tomorrow. Take the money, leave the gear, go on your merry way, I said to myself. Granted, I had only been paid half of the job, but still, it was a decent amount. We get packed up, and the crew and I head out, packing my toolbox and other smaller items in the truck. I notice Timothy's locking up the doors of the place and then escorts us to the gates. He closes them, with him on the other side. I pull my truck up to the gate. You're living on site? Timothy hesitates for a moment, but answers, Yes, I have a trailer out back. See you bright and early tomorrow, then. Timothy just nods and waves me off. I never actually paid attention to where he went from there. I turn to Chavez in the truck and ask, So what did you and Timothy talk about? Okay, is all I get from Chavez. He has to be messing with me. I put it out of my mind, drop Chavez off at his place. He waves, as always, Gracias, Señor Fred, and heads home. I head back home as well. At home, the kids are asleep, as is the wife, and I've got my toolbox in the garage. I pop open my toolbox as I've got to swap a few things in and out for the next day, specifically some mixing bits and the like. When I open my toolbox, however, something inside of it is certainly not a tool I've ever used. I suddenly recognize it. It's the object that came out of the gash. My toolbox was open behind me. It must have closed when the thing slammed into it. The object is about three inches wide, deep in the center, two feet long, and about three inches thick at the top, tapering to a point at the bottom. It looks almost like a wedge, and I realize it's probably blood that seeped into this gash and solidified over the years. I pick it up, and it's light, but despite my attempts, I can't break this thing. Looking at this object in the light for the first time, it's almost like a blade. Either that or the shape of the gash just shaped this thing into one. The top is flat, the bottom comes to a point. Not sharp, but it could be. Light seems to penetrate through the edge of this thing, and it's tinted, deep red. The rest appears to be black. I didn't even know blood could become a solid, but I guess if there's enough of it, it's possible. It's about 10 after 11 when I swear I hear three taps against my front door, as if I had a knocker or something. I don't, by the way. I leave the object in my toolbox, closing it and locking it, and head to the front door. I'm not an idiot. I make sure to check my closet next to the door and make sure my shotgun's loaded. It's after 11 p.m. What psycho comes knocking at someone's door at this time of night? I open the door halfway, and I'm greeted by an outstretched hand with a black ring on each finger, one of which was about to tap again on the door. The hand pulls back and clasps a wide-brimmed white hat, removing it from his head and lowering it to about chest level. One hand is behind him, and he's standing a good six foot three, wearing a white duster of some sort and a red tie over a black, very expensive-looking dress shirt. He has white-rimmed glasses and yellowish eyes behind them, jet black hair that's well kept. As he speaks, it's almost like his voice doesn't match his body. His face isn't odd but doesn't stand out, and his voice sounds almost like it comes from an old cop movie. Evening, young man. I understand you're working with an associate of mine. Goes by Timothy. While client confidentiality is not my cornerstone, keeping my business out of my personal life sure as heck is. Uh, sorry, buddy, but I'm going to have to ask you to talk to me during business hours. His face falls slightly. Now, this is important regarding that place you're working in. Timothy may have you misled. You see, he's using this place for his own means, not prosperity. He pulls out some kind of business card and twirls it over each of his fingers before handing it to me. I look it over. It just has a phone number on it. No other information. His other hand brings an unlit cigarette to his mouth. He inhales, smoke venting out of his nostrils. If you were to happen across something of note, I'd be appreciative if you could contact me. I'm not doing that. I'm not the kind that take things from a work site. 
Normally, this is completely true. A grin spread across the guy's face, and his oddly perfect teeth almost glisten in the light on my porch. True, be ashamed to take something that you don't understand, only to wind up dead. He cocks an eyebrow at me. Or worse. I had it with the creep on my porch at this point. Listen, pal, hit the bricks, you hear me? Get off my property or I'll call the cops. I try a cocky grin myself now. Or worse. I don't think it works. He stands still. I can barely tell if he's breathing. I pump the shotgun behind the door. I know there's no point to this. I just ejected a perfectly good shell, but I wanted him to hear that I've got a gun. It's pump action, and it's in my hand. His voice suddenly changes, or he just drops the facade in a raspy voice like that of a lifelong chain smoker slithers out of his throat. Half a whisper, half a wheeze. No parting with it, then, eh? Well, I'll have it one way or another for certain. The accent's hard to place. It's not quite Middle Eastern, but it's not like anything I've ever heard. I now pull the shotgun out and point it at his face. And now I'm done with you. Whoever you are, get out. He doesn't even flinch. He just grins more, a hissing chuckle dripping out of his mouth. You are a fun one. Never once does your sort disappoint, always resorting to the fire provided by Prometheus. Yet, he pauses, eyeing the barrel of the gun, never considering where it came from. I'm not sure where he pulled it from, but he suddenly crunches into an apple he must have had in his pocket. I suppose I'll have to reconsider. Maybe when you're asleep, like what happened to that hooker you cleaned up from a few years back on Broadway? My heart skipped a beat. I don't like talking about clients, and clients would never talk about me, and I never go into that much detail either. I just restore stuff. A man of your skills is bound to clean up a homicide or two, knowingly or not. He tilts his head back, looking at me down the barrel of the gun, cleaning up the sin left behind by those less scrupulous than yourself. Oh, we've been watching you for some time. Now, for some reason, his eyes go wider. Red Fred. I click the safety of the shotgun and put my finger on the trigger. Get out now. Another loud crunch of his apple, and he seems to mockingly throw his hands up, walking backward, keeping eye contact with me with those yellow eyes. Very well. Another time, then. You are a fun one, Red. He turns and starts to walk off. I haven't moved the gun. Still trained on him. Don't call me Red, you... I realize I hadn't gotten this creep's name. The card that he gave me only had a phone number. Whatever your God-given name is. My mother always said that when she was mad. She'd shout it into phones all the time when telemarketers would give her fake names and stuff. What's your God-given name? So it's a force of habit I picked up. I only said it when I was really pissed at somebody and this guy had me livid, bar none the dumbest thing I apparently did all day. He stops, dead on my walkway, and his hands slowly go down to his sides. Oh, his voice whispers out as if he'd just won a prize. You compel my God-given name. His head starts to turn toward his right shoulder, but his shoulders aren't moving, not an inch. As I watch, I get ready to shoot. I swear, if his head does a full 180-degree turn, I don't care what his name is, I'm going to start shooting until he stops moving and probably pump a few more rounds in just to be sure. His head stops, just shy of completely turned. I can see both of his yellow eyes as he slowly placed his hat back on his head. He grins, and I swear I watch his pupils dilate till his eyes look almost entirely black with yellowish rings around them. You can tell Timothy my name, too. He lets out another hissing laugh, and I swear I can hear the gun shaking in my hands for some reason. It's Balil. I don't know why, but I felt the blood drain out of my face for a moment, and the whole area got a bit dimmer as if something were draining it of light. I stagger slightly, but regain my footing, press the shotgun butt against my shoulder tightly, as if it's somehow going to help me. He turns away from me, and he walks off. He wheezes out, Don't forget to tell Timothy I stopped by. 
Another puff of smoke clouds around his head. And what I stopped by for. I pulled the gun back, shut the door, locked it, and shut the blinds. My heart was hammering in my chest as I checked the shells in my gun to ensure that I had it loaded. I click the safety back on and I rush upstairs to my bedroom. The wife is fast asleep as I sit on the edge of the bed, gun in hand, staring at my front door down the stairs. I swear I can hear something tap against my window three times, random times all night. Part 3 of the Creepypasta Restoration is up next on Weird Darkness. Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Part 3. Morning came, and I haven't put the shotgun down yet, still sitting at the end of the bed and checking the windows. It seemed like the tapping stopped sometime around dawn. I hear my wife's alarm clock go off and the sounds of her rousing from her sleep. Morning, honey, she mumbles, brunette hair a mass of frizz and tangles. Morning, I say, simply, making sure she's okay. She gets out of bed and heads to the bathroom. I hear the kids' alarms go off next, and my boys are heard roughhousing in their room. My wife Sandy comes out of the bathroom, toothbrush in hand, and is about to motion for me to go contain the wild animals that are my 15- and 13-year-old boys. She stops when she spots the shotgun in my hand. She quickly spits out her toothpaste. Fred, why are you holding this shotgun? She looks me up and down with her soft brown eyes. Are those the clothes you had on when you came home yesterday? Honey, I got visited by a guy who's probably not human in the least, and he threatened the family if I don't return a red blade-like object that came from some mysterious excavation site. That's the most truthful thing I wanted to say. It also sounds bat-crap insane, and the more I play the sentence over and over in my head, I question my own sanity. Fred? Sandy pokes my shoulder. Apparently, I was staring off into space while trying to think up a logical response to her completely rational question. I, uh, someone was on the lawn last night, was banging on the door, and wouldn't go away until I got the shotgun. Sandy cocks her hip and shoots me one of those emasculating wife stares. So, rather than call the cops, you reach for the shotgun? I cock the shotgun and clear the ammo out before heading back down to the closet to put it and the shells back. Just wasn't sure if it was a prowler or kids. Sandy pokes her head out of the bedroom. And speaking of, Colin, Trevor, shake a leg! I close the closet, see my boys bounding down the steps in various states of dress, dragging their backpacks and heading to the table. They start fighting over cereal, and I quickly resolve it, before a good scolding and getting them prepped for the bus. They finish up and are soon out the door with coats and sneakers on. My wife follows down next, wearing her robe. Don't you have that job today? I nod, looking at the time. Yeah, you're right. Then get motivated. I do, and head out the door, give the wife a kiss, and I'm heading back to the site making sure my toolbox is with me. Same as the first morning Timothy is there at the gate. He undoes the chain, and we all head to the mansion again. He props the doors open, and the crew heads in. I get the business squared away first, 
Chavez and Pete on the scissor lift to finish a few touches on the walls, while Bob and Mike get to mixing the quick set and filling in the gash in the floor. They also work on making sure there's a barrier between the gash and the rest of the work area, so we can work on the rest of the flooring. During this prep work, I noticed Mike eyeing the doorway. Mike, you taking in the scenery? Mike points to the roof on the outside. Stapled. He leans into the doorway, shining a light up to the ceiling. Flat. I look to Mike. Attic. Mike pulls out a laser measurer. Steeple Peak is 53 feet. He leans in. Ceiling is 50 feet. He leans out again. Low Point Steeple is 44 feet. He leans back in. Flat ceiling is 50 feet. I grumble a bit. Our last day here, Mike. Get the job done. That thing's probably on the fritz. My eyes aren't on the fritz, Fred. Damn your eyes! I see Bob looking at the same thing as Mike. Bob, do something! Bob seems startled, but manages to compose himself and get back to setting up his tools. I walk past the crew as they prep and pop open my toolbox. I find the strange object or artifact or whatever out of my toolbox and head toward Timothy. Timothy is observing Chavez and Pete when he spots me coming. This wound up in my toolbox, I say holding the object out in front of me. Timothy looks it over without touching it, then looks to me after a solid minute. This came from here? I nod. Yeah, from inside that gash in the floor. Timothy holds his right hand over the thing for a moment, then he starts guiding his hand back and forth over it, slowly. I have no clue what he's doing. I'm about to ask, but as I look up, I notice his eyes seem to be a more intense blue than they were before specifically his right eye. Timothy stops suddenly and just grabs the thing with his right hand and pulls it hard out of my grip. Thanks for returning this. He turns it over in his hand again. His eyes seem to be a normal shade of blue again. It's a very rare find. That's what your associate said. I was hoping to fish for some info. If this Belial guy knows Timothy, then Timothy should know him. Associate? He looks at me quizzically. I nod. Yeah, tall guy, kind of yellow eyes, way too perfect teeth. Timothy seems completely confused. I'm afraid I don't know anyone like that. All my associates are here. Figured it was time to stop trying to get him to spill the beans and just come out and say it. Listen, the guy shows up last night, tells me he wants that thing, and then tells me his name is Belial and that you know him. Timothy's face goes slightly pale. You're certain he said Belial? I just nod. Timothy looks to the object and then walks to the doors. Sorry for this, but I hope you have everything you need inside. And he shuts the doors. I'm a bit dumbfounded at this point. I thought you were concerned about ventilation. Timothy just walks right past me and toward the barricade. Ventilation is the least of your worries at the moment. I turn around and the entire crew is dead silent. Not sure what to do as we hear some banging, a few doors closing, and then some rustling past the barricade. I just come out and say it. We have this one last day to get the floor cleaned and get that gash and the smaller scrapes and holes plugged. Move it now, and then we get out of here. The crew seems pretty much on board, and the sounds of work soon overpower anything else. Almost half an hour since Timothy left, I suddenly feel a hand on my shoulder and I spin around out of sheer instinct. A small, round bottle is shoved into my hands. That's for you, Timothy says, before he hands the bottle to the rest of the crew. I look and see it's just a small, round glass bottle with a long spout at the top and a cap. Timothy doesn't have the object in question any longer and now he heads toward the barrier again. As he passes me, I grab him. I need at least a what-the-hell-this-is explanation and a who-the-hell-is-that for this Belial guy. I glare at him. That, Timothy says as he points to the bottle, is for protection from Belial. That's half of my questions, Tim. Timothy. Who the hell is Belial? I reiterate. He looks up to the angelic statue and I turn to see the large statue of St. Dinah. He's her opposite, 
Before he can elaborate, he's back behind the barrier. Just finish up today and get the hell out. It's all I can think of. I grab a pressure washer and start working alongside my guys to get things rolling. It's the end of the day, and it's cleanup time. Timothy opens the doors and checks outside for something, and we all start loading up the trucks. Timothy looks around, seemingly satisfied. This is quite excellent work, Fred. Thank you. I nod, hoping we can finish up shortly. The gash in the floor is fully repaired. It'll take a full 24 hours to cure, but you can walk across it without much issue. We cleaned up the main hall here, got the walls, statues, ceilings, and, of course, the flooring squared away. And the amphitheater, Chavez says, as he and Pete seem to be pulling equipment from the left side of the room. Pete's face is pretty pale as he walks by, but I stop them regardless. Amphitheater? Pete just looks to me and shakes his head. I sigh. Chavez, that wasn't in the order. Timothy chimes in. How did you get into the amphitheater? I'm never going to get out of this place, am I? So close, yet so far. Chavez happily shows us down the left-hand side of the hall and clicks on the lights. A pair of massive, 50-foot double doors stand right in front of us and reach from floor to ceiling. The ceiling looks like it tapers to a dome. It's not so much that there's a pair of massive, 50-foot-tall double doors right in front of me that are almost 20 feet wide. It's what's on the damn things that bother me. Carved into the marble are pictures of armor-clad angels with feathery wings. Under their feet are various horrible-looking creatures. A few of the angels stand over said defeated creatures with spears shoved in them. Others are in the process of smiting them. As the doors go up, the carvings get weirder. Not just feathery angels, but these other winged humanoid things. They look like lizards with wings. Stranger still is at the very top of these doors is a huge lizard-like figure, massive bat-like wings spread out, holding a shield with a cross on it and a huge spear. It's hard to see fully, but the doors seem to meet, or at least have to meet in the middle where his face would be. If you could call it a face, that is, there's mostly a lizard head with horns over a long snail-like neck. Chavez takes a knee in front of the doors and starts reciting the Lord's Prayer again. One of them clicks open. Voice-activated doors? I ask, hoping there's some kind of rational explanation and wondering why we haven't left yet. Chavez gets up and opens the door enough to walk in. He drags one of the lamps in and powers it up, motioning for us to come in. We found this door here, and I and Pete cleaned it up. It was easier than the rest. The floor here is different. I look down and thank God there's a seam. I finally found a seam in this place. But the seam is from marble to granite, and as I walk in, it's pretty clear that, oddly, everything is made of granite in this room. Stacking up into the darkness, so high I couldn't even tell, were chairs. These chairs were large, stone chairs. They all culminated around a central chair. A chair is an understatement, I guess. It's more of a throne. The chairs all surrounded the stage we found ourselves on in a huge crescent. I turned to Timothy, whose gaze was transfixed on the central throne, that faraway look again in his eyes. Chavez was again the only one to speak. Saint Dinah? Timothy nods and leaves the room. I did not know how those doors opened. Thank you, Chavez. I click the lights off and pull the lights out, making sure everybody is out of the now perfectly dark room. Good work, guys. Now let's get packed. I'm now overly invested in getting out of here as fast as possible. Pete leans over to me, whispering. The door outside and the amphitheater doors are on the same wall, but there's no structure on the outside that could fit that. I noticed this as well as I walked outside the mansion and then back inside. Pete? Yeah? Don't think about it. Pete just frowns at me. I guess that's the best bet. I give a final examination of the place before we kill the last of the lights, and I do have to say the place is looking nice. The white marble floor is polished to the point where I can see my reflection. The gash is sealed up nice and neat and just looks like a vein in the marble. Everything is looking perfect inside. The walls, 
the ceiling, the floor. I give a little nod to the St. Dinah statue and head to the door as the lights are taken down. I do my head count, and once again I'm short a Honduran. I walk back inside and find Chavez kneeling in front of the statue of St. Dinah, only the light from the setting sun reflecting off the floor to light the room softly. Chavez, end of the day, let's go. I'm staying, he says simply. I notice the bottle that Timothy handed him is empty. Did you drink that? I said, a bit shocked. Do you even know what's in it, Chavez? God's blessing. Chavez stands up and he just looks, for lack of a better word, happy, like a man without a care in the world. I'm not just leaving you here, Chavez. The client isn't going to like you hanging around here. Timothy chimes in, walking back from behind the barrier again. Actually, Chavez agreed to assist me in a few things going forward. I turn to look at Timothy. You ever think I might not want to lose a member of my crew? Chavez speaks up. Mr. Fred, it's okay. I want to stay here. I want to help St. Timothy interrupts. He volunteered. It was hard to say no to him. I give Chavez a look. He just smiles and extends his hand. Nice working with you, Fred. I ignore it. Get your head on straight. I'm your ride. I'm staying, Fred. I turn and shout, Chavez, I'm not staying here any longer, okay? I'm out. Done. Finished. I stop for a second. I didn't say finished. I said finito, but for some reason it came out as English. I'm 100% done with this place, all right? I'm out. Job's done. You want to stay? Enjoy. I head towards my truck, look to my toolbox, ensure nothing else is there that shouldn't be, close it, and out I go. As I head out of the doors, Timothy starts to close them behind us, him and Chavez still inside. Timothy looks to me before he closes the doors. The remainder of your payment is in the truck. Everything we discussed. I cannot fully express my gratitude. He shuts the door, and we load up. I check the truck, and there's an envelope with the second half of the payment. I'm pretty shocked, and I count the bills a few times. I'm up a good ten grand. I've heard of getting a tip, but this was a bit overkill. I know one pair of kids whose college fund is going to be in a good place after all this. At home, I'm doing the husband thing and cleaning up the dishes from the wife's dinner. Sandy and the boys are asleep, and that's when I hear a crash in the garage. I run to the closet, grab the shotgun, and fill it with a few shells before I rush in. I'm kind of expecting him at this point. My toolbox and all the tools are strewn about all over the floor. I see my garage door opened slightly, and suddenly something small, almost glass-like, hits me in the face. I look down to see what looks like a chunk of the object that was in my toolbox, about the size of a half dollar, land on the floor. That is but a pittance, Red Fred. I turn to the voice, and I see glowing yellow eyes in the darkness. Not nearly what I need. I pull the gun and go to shoot, but I feel a tug against my entire body as if someone grabbed onto my sweatshirt from the front and pulled it downward. I barely take a step forward, but it's enough to get me to point the gun down at the floor. I look up at Belial's hand, dropping from being in midair, steam rising off the black rings on his fingers. Weak, not this weak, though. Another hissing laugh. He offered you protection. How noble. Before I can take aim, a tool shoots off my workbench and smacks into the shotgun, which lands a few feet from me. I lunge for it, but it suddenly leaps off the floor and into Belial's hand. Belial takes the shotgun and places it against his shoulder, looking down on me, as if a little bauble could do anything against me. I try to get up, but he places his foot on my shoulder. I can't move. You've done something very foolish, Red Fred. He soon's crouching down onto his haunches over me. You've hidden the only thing that can help me move up from a puppeteer to God. The shotgun barrel now slides under my chin as I see Belial's face illuminated by the light coming from the doorway. But there's hope for you yet. I'm shaking at this point, as I'm not sure how the tables turned so fast. You can fix your mistake. 
and in return I'll spare you and your family's lives. His voice wheezes, but not as much as it did before. He somehow seems stronger. Despite how I look, I've done quite a bit to exist in this world. Possessions, normally a lesser demon's game, but the discovery of that sanguine amber. He cocks the shotgun. I could not resist. I'm sweating, and slowly I try to get to my feet. I'm on my hands and knees by the time I feel the barrel at the back of my head. Now this is your next course of action. You will leave here right away and retrieve from me the sanguine amber you found. You will bring it back here and give it to me. In return, you will be at my side rather than in my path. I swear I can hear his grin somehow. Nod if you understand. I just nod. What else could I do? If you do not bring me the amber, if you do not return home, or if you somehow reach out to Timothy for aid, I will go upstairs and I will make your children watch as I violate your wife in every way you can and cannot imagine. I clench my fists. If you lay a hand on her, I'll... You're what, mortal? I hear the safety slide off. Bleed on me? I relax and I hear the safety slide back as the gun clatters to the floor. You're on the clock, Freddy. I look up, and the garage is clean. The door isn't open. There isn't even a sign that I had dropped the shotgun, as it's sitting neatly on my workbench. I get to my feet, shaking, and turn to see a figure right behind me, causing me to shout in fear. Sandy is behind me, and she punches me in the shoulder. She it's just me. Why are you so jumpy, Fred? What's going on? I rub my shoulder where she nailed me, and I try to figure out how best to protect one's family from someone who's clearly not from this world. That's when I remember what Timothy handed me at the worksite. I rush to the closet to find my coat. Were you on the phone? I thought I heard you talking to someone, Sandy asks. I pull the bottle out of my coat and turn to her, pressing the bottle into her hands. Sandy? I know this is going to sound bat-crap nuts, but I need you to drink this and share it with the boys, okay? They're asleep, Fred, Sandy says curtly. She looks at the bottle and raises an eyebrow. This isn't some random point where you poison us all and run off to Malibu with some bimbo, is it? I grab her by the shoulders, looking her dead in the eye. I'm asking you to trust me. Just drink half the bottle. Split the rest with the kids, okay? I need you to do that for me right now. Just drink half. Sandy's clearly worried now, but she undoes the cap on the bottle. Okay, Fred. Okay, calm down. She takes a swig, then another, until the bottle is half empty, and caps it. So, I drank it. What? She trails off and suddenly closed her eyes, opening them again and looking right into my eyes. Oh, wow, that's probably the best water I ever drank. I nod. Make sure you give it to the boys, okay? I left something at the work site, and I need to get it. Sandy just nods. I love you, Fred. I let go of her shoulders. I love you, too. Just make sure the kids drink that and keep the doors locked, okay? Don't let anyone inside. Sandy just nods again. Okay, Fred. Be careful. She walks up the stairs and waves smiling serenely as I rush out the door, lock it, and make my way to my truck. In retrospect, I should have kissed her. I was driving swiftly, fast enough to be a little worried, but not fast enough to get pulled over. I got to the gate of the work site in roughly an hour, which was pretty good time from my house. I saw the gate wasn't chained anymore, which seemed odd because Timothy had to undo that chain every time. Did he never leave the mansion after they closed the doors? I drove down the driveway and hit my brights, knowing it might be dark in that main hallway, and ran to the doors. Timothy, open up! I slammed my fist on the door. Damn it, Timothy, open the damn door! I looked to see there's no padlock on the door and jostle the old doorknob, swinging the doors open. Chavez! Timothy! I shout into the empty room, expecting an echo, but I hear no such sound. I'm hit with a musty scent the smell of rotting wood and mildewed fabric. I look around, pulling out a flashlight. The boards are letting light in from the front. There are no statues, 
no marble floor, just a set of collapsed staircases and a rotting subfloor with a few ripped and torn rugs and graffiti. I take a step outside and just confirm it's the same place. Then peek back inside. The barricades are gone. The marble ceilings, the walls, the seamless floor, it's as if it was never there. I run through the ruins of this ancient mansion. The mansion is mundane, old, too ruined to fix, should be knocked down. I try a door or two, each opening to rotting room after rotting room. I eventually became overwhelmed with the fungus in the air and I stumbled out the door, falling to my knees near my car. As I tried to catch my breath, I tried to figure out what the hell was going on. I turned to look at the old mansion behind me, and I could only think of one thing. The site we were working on was gone, or was never here in the first place, and the amber was gone with it. Part 4 of this creepypasta is up next on Weird Darkness. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there's the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. Part 4 I was panicked. I wasn't even sure what to do. Timothy was a don't ask customer, so I had no contact info saved, no way to reach him, not even a cell number. That's what I realized I did have some hope. I got back into the truck and hauled myself to the office. I could get there in about 20 minutes. I could check the caller ID and maybe reach him that way. I zipped out of the long driveway and got moving as fast as possible leaving the gate open. I don't even think I closed the doors to the old mansion. I got to the office in just under 15 minutes. I fumbled with the lock, having to stop myself for a second and then calmly get the key into the slot. I pulled the door open and rushed to my desk. I hit the call history on the phone and I finally got a number. Out of state, sure. It was from New York, which was fine and probably the right number. I hit the speed redial while jotting the number down. My stomach dropped when it went directly to voicemail, and I heard a message on the other end. You've reached Major Timothy Crestfall. Please leave a message, and I'll get back to you shortly. Godspeed. I hadn't caught my breath by the time the beep occurred. Uh, Timothy, please, you need to call me back. Belial's threatening my family, my wife, the kids. I, I gave them that water you gave me, but this guy, he's... I don't think, should I say it out loud, to make it real? I don't think he's human. Help me! I hung up and tried to call again, direct to voicemail once more. A random thought ran past my frantic mind. He's a bit young looking for an officer, right? My cell phone rings. It's a 1-800 number of some sort, calling me in the middle of the night. I was about to ignore it, but something told me I shouldn't. I answered the phone. This is Fred. Who's this? There's a crackle on the other line. I hear something like a scream before it cuts out entirely. A young man's on the line, and he sounds shaken. Sir, are you Mr. Fred Massioni? 
Yeah, who's this? Hey, this is your home alarm central monitoring. Sir, we're getting alerts that multiple smoke detectors have alarmed in your home. We've contacted the fire department, but we're not able to reach anybody in the house via the front panel. Are you at home at the moment? I feel a little dizzy, but I stand up regardless and make my way to my car. Oh, God, have you tried my wife's cell? Yes, sir, we've attempted multiple times. Are you home? No, no, I'm not home. The fire department's on the way, sir. Do you need me to stay on the line with you? No, I'm going home. I jump out of the office, leaving it unlocked, and I get in the truck. At this point, I don't give a single solitary damn about speed limits. I'm flooring it. I'm not even paying attention to the speedometer until I look in my rear view and I see police lights. I pull over, shaking, not even sure what's going on, what's happening with my family. I keep thinking that they're going to be safe, that I gave that holy water stuff to them and they have to be alive and well because of that. Chavez called it uh, God's blessing. A tap against my window, and I roll it down quickly. The cop is a gruff-looking, heavy-set black guy. In a hurry? My voice cracks, and I try to compose myself. Officer, I got a message from my alarm company that there are smoke alarms going off in my house. I got about 20 minutes to get there. I need a pass on this. The officer puts his hand out. License, sir? I curse and hand him my license and I hear him actually running to his car. I contemplate just speeding off right then and there, scenarios going through my head of him shooting out my tires or turning the entire thing into a police chase. My train of thought is broken when he runs back to my window, giving me my license. Follow me. Try to keep up, sir. What? I'm confused by this. I'm giving you an escort. I think I went pale at this point. The cop puts his hand on my shoulder. Sir, do you need me to give you a lift? I look to my shaking hands and just nod dumbly. He opens my truck door, takes out the keys, and undoes the seatbelt. Before I know what's going on, I'm in his squad car and we're speeding down the streets with sirens blaring. I hear the radio chatter come in and out, but I can barely understand it. He grabs his radio. Car 314, I got a resident of 335 Locust Street en route to the scene. The scene? I'm still in disbelief, shock, and can barely tell when we're on my street and the car finally slows down after it was done running every red light and every stop sign. The car comes to a stop and I scramble out of the car. I'm half blinded by the sea of emergency vehicles, ambulance, fire, other cop cars. I think briefly that at least the alarm system did something after ten years of a monthly subscription. The heavyset officer is already out and parting the onlookers in front of me stepping past the caution tape. He says something to the other officers as I wander onto my front lawn. I stagger onto the lawn to see the smoldering remains of my home. Firefighters are working to put one of the fires out. I look around frantically trying to spot Sandy and the boys. I eventually find them. Three body bags are on the lawn, sealed, two smaller forms inside and another that reminds me of my wife when she would hide under the sheets. I feel pain in my knees suddenly. Apparently, I fell at seeing them. I feel a pair of hands on my shoulders, another roughly handling my arms and hefting me up. My legs barely function as I'm led to the back of an ambulance. The heavyset officer helps me sit down in the back of the ambulance. Through all the white noise, I see a very bright light in my face, and a voice slowly, finally comes through. Can you hear me, sir? Sir? A young black woman is in front of me with an ophthalmoscope. I blink, finally shaking my head. Yeah. She moves the bright light back and forth, and I start to come out of my funk. I look to the pavement. They didn't make it out, did they? Her tone is empathetic, but practiced. I'm sorry, no, we did everything we could, but by the time the fire department was even able to reach them, it was too late. I do my best not to just burst into tears, but they come anyway. I suppress a sob, try to swallow it down. I blink a few tears out of my eyes and hear the female EMT walk away. I hear a few male voices approaching. This him? Okay, I got it from here. You can fall back. Uh, might get ugly, you know? I shake my head, knocking a few tears out. Cops are going to be asking me questions and I need to be composed. I try to dry my eyes, but it doesn't work. 
I feel the ambulance shift slightly as somebody sits next to me. Mr. Massioni? I nod, eyes still downcast. I'm Detective Benjamin Liebel. Got a few questions to ask, mostly regarding your whereabouts prior to the fire. Smoke? A pack of cigarettes is offered. I take one, accept the light, and take a deep breath. I'm about to say something when I think about how odd that name sounds. I hear a wheezing snicker, and the voice changes to one I'm far too familiar with. I'm kidding, Freddy. I know where you were. My head snaps to my left, and I see Belial. He's sitting right next to me, black hair slicked back above his pale face, yellow eyes, and white teeth too white. His duster is still white, but in addition to the red tie, he has a police ID badge hanging around his neck. I clench my fist, grit my teeth, but before I can stand and deck him in his perfect teeth, his hand is on my fist and he's hushing me, pulling my hand down. Shush, he starts. I was just delivering on a promise, Red Fred. I try to push against his hand, but it doesn't budge. Stop calling me that. We all call you that, Red Fred. You should get used to it. His grin fades. But I have to give you some kudos, Freddy. That was a dirty trick. What the hell are you talking about? His grin seems to return somewhat. When I couldn't pull you towards me, I assumed you had drunk some of the sanctified water from the Guardian Temple. Guardian Temple? Belial snickers, almost hissing. The place you were cleaning, Freddy. He takes a deep breath, wheezing out his next words. As I said, you surprised me, giving your only protection against me to your family, smarter than I took you for. I glared daggers at him, even with my tears in my eyes. This seems to make him even happier. You see, Fred, normally what I would have done would have been to march up to your children's bedroom wake them, and then take them to Mommy. I'd then torture her relentlessly until she forsakes you and the children, and then promise her an end to her pain in exchange for her soul. A chill runs down my spine. The strong ones resist, right up until I threaten to put the children through the same pain I'm putting her through. He is grinning a sick grin from ear to ear. Then I take her soul in exchange for the safety of her children. Once that's mine, I remove the love she holds for her family, for God, make her one of my whores, and then she usually would just kill the kids on her own. He lights his own cigarette. You know, for fun. I can feel the horror just wash over me. It's almost without fail. Worked for at least nine out of ten. I try to swallow the lump in my throat. But you, Fred, his grin fades, you robbed me of a good time. You see, normally, if, if you drink a half bottle of that holy water, you're protected from possession and the like. But what you did, Fred, giving them your protection selflessly, that bumped the potency up something fierce. He showed me his left hand the skin on his palm almost entirely black, his hand shriveled and shaking. One of his rings even falls off his finger and shatters when it hits the ground. He curses in some unknown guttural language as this happens. You see, Fred, that happened when I reached out and grabbed your wife's arm, burned like a mother. Still feel it burning, actually. He now glares at me. The yellow in his eyes seems to be moving. So... With me being unable to touch them, I had to take some more mundane methods of keeping my promise. He pulls his hand away and slides a leather glove over it. Broke the doorknobs, nailed a few windows down, made sure they didn't get out as I burned the place down, bottom to top. He snickers. You protected your family from me, but the house was a different story. I'm gritting my teeth staring daggers at Belial as he seems to be enjoying telling me all of this. His tone changes, however. I've never had to end someone like that. It was so mundane, so dull, and knowing that their souls were saved as I did it. Smoke spews from his nostrils as he huffs and wheezes again. 
What nasty taste to leave in my mouth, Fred. He stands. But you've been through enough today. I'll let you live for now. Belial turns to me. Unless you want to make it easier on everyone, just, you know. He slides a finger across his throat. Might be nice to do something ironic, you know. As a tire swing in the backyard, could hang yourself from it. As he speaks, I feel kind of woozy and confused. Maybe at the hotel. Take the hairdryer and take a shower with it. I shake my head. It feels like someone's shoving cotton in my ears and I can only hear his voice over the background noises. His breath is on my ear now. When you think about it, what sort of man can't even protect his family? The only honorable way out is to remove yourself from the equation. Suddenly he's gone, and I can think clearly again. The EMT is back, and she starts taking my vitals. I'm gazing up at the night sky, and I've got no idea what I'm going to do. The next week goes by like I'm a passenger in my own body. I work out details with funeral directors and lawyers and insurance companies. I get tired of hearing the words, sorry for your loss. I'm bouncing between absolute sorrow and blinding anger, and I can't control which family member I snap at or sob in front of. By the time the funeral day comes, it's me and a few friends and family on my wife's side. I'm in a church, first time in years, and the organ is playing a sad old tune while I sit at one of the front pews, alone. My family wants little to do with me. Half of them think I burned the house down in a triple homicide. The news was leaked, somehow, about how the windows were nailed shut and the doorknobs were removed before being locked. So I'm pretty shocked when someone in a rather nice suit and some pretty powerful cologne sits next to me. We only just heard. A pretty thick Latin accent chimes in, but a pretty familiar one. I look up to see Chavez, of all people, sitting next to me. He's wearing a pretty expensive tailored suit, too. Chavez? He points to a necklace of some kind around his neck. Temple charm helps you understand me even when we're outside of it. I sit up, looking him over, extremely confused. Why are you here? I narrow my eyes. And where is Timothy? Chavez frowns. He's here. But I told him not to come to you yet. I know you blame him for this. No, duh, Chavez. I looked around the church before Chavez put his hand on my shoulder. Where is he? Chavez shakes his head. Now isn't the time, Fred. I now glare at Chavez. So what? You're his lackey now? I stare ahead at the three caskets, all closed before me. What the hell is he? Not what we both thought is all Chavez said. We're both quiet for some time before Chavez decides to piss me off. I know how you feel. Screw you, Chavez! I glare at him. I'm out of tears at this point. I'm just in an angry mood right now. You know how I feel? Sandy and the boys didn't deserve this. She was an amazing woman. The boys were good kids. They didn't deserve this. It's because of me getting mixed up with Timothy's bullcrap temple or whatever it was, so don't give me the I know how you feel nonsense. You don't have a friggin' clue. Chavez is silent as he looks ahead at the caskets. When I was in Honduras, I helped the cartels smuggle drugs past the border. I would build chairs, tables, and the like. They'd hide the coke in them, and I made the trap doors. But one day my trap doors all started to get found out. One day the cartel comes to me and they tell me that they're going to try something new. They want me to make crucifixes and hide the drugs in them. They tell me the drugs won't be found as easy because people won't check the crucifixes. He makes a sign of the cross over his heart. I refused. I tell them I'm going to leave. I promise not to tell the police, but I tell them that I'm done. He turns to me, hands now clasped in his lap. The next day, I wake up with a bag on my head. I think they're going to kill me, you know? I make peace with God and accept my fate. They bring me to a river. Along with it, they have my mother, father, wife, my daughter all lined up. His normally happy face turns mournful. 
They don't even give me a choice. They execute my family in front of me, throw them into the river. They tell me, you live for the cartel or you die for the cartel. I just look away at this point. Chavez leans back in the pew, now looking at me. You get to bury your family, Fred. Be happy for that. I'll never have that. It was taken from me. I turn to him. His story is probably worse than my own. Not that I'm weighing tragedies or anything. Chavez, I ask, you never answered me. Why are you even here right now? Chavez looks around as if searching for someone. Fred, you always helped me out. You gave me a job. Gave me a ride to my place when I needed it. Chavez gives me a sympathetic smile. I'm here because I'm your friend. As a man, I usually leave crying for the macho stuff. Grand Canyon, funerals. I guess this was an exception, though. Of all the people who would show up when I needed it if you told me it would be Jorge Chavez, the illegal immigrant who's the best guy I know with the sandblaster, I'd never believed you. Now I'm sobbing next to the guy and he's doing his best to comfort me. Chavez even volunteers to be a pallbearer at the end of the ceremony. At the graveyard, he is the last one to stand with me. I turn to him as I'm still swinging between deep depression and seething anger. Chavez, how can you still believe in God? He took everything from you, and yet you're still faithful? Chavez starts to unbutton his jacket as he talks. When the cartel killed my wife, they forced me to be their runner. He undoes his jacket and now is undoing some buttons on his shirt. One day, during a drop, I see a hole in the border fence to America. I think to myself, I could live in the cartel or die free. I prayed to God and asked Him to protect me during my escape. I ran. He reveals his chest. There's a hole just below his ribcage on the right. It looks like a bullet wound. It missed my heart, lungs, and didn't even hit bone. A one in a million shot. A miracle, Fred. God's protection. That's why we should thank Him every day, he said while tapping the scar. Thank Him, Chavez. Where was he when Sandy and the boys needed help, huh? Where was God? Why didn't he help them? Chavez looks me dead in the eyes as he buttons up his shirt. Did you ask him to help, Fred? I'm silent. I just stare ahead of me, past the graves. It can't possibly be that simple, I tell myself. That whole ask and you shall receive nonsense. After a while, Chavez leaves my side. A few minutes later, I hear someone walking up behind me. I look, still facing ahead, and see Timothy in a black trench coat and suit with black tie behind me. You've got balls, man, I say curtly. I never intended for this, Timothy says plainly. He looks over the graves. What you did to protect them was, well, it was beyond what I thought you could do. He had started to smile a bit, but now his smile faded. If I had known you had a family, I'd have given you some other tools. I turn and march right up to him. Despite this, he doesn't flinch as I get into his face. Yeah, your tools were really friggin' useful. I gave my wife and the boys that sacred water, and it just gave them a quicker death. It saved their souls, Fred, Timothy says simply. Because of you, your wife's soul isn't in the possession of Belial. Neither are your children. Bull crap! I shout. That's not how this crap works. You don't lose your soul if the demon possesses you. Sometimes you die, but I know enough about that stuff to know you're just screwing me over. I talked to the priests. You think Belial is a demon? I take a step back. What else could he be? Timothy's face doesn't change expression in the least. Belial was first a dark angel long ago. He was tasked with punishing impure souls. That was before the war. Timothy looks to the sky. I look up with him. What war? The war of cherubim and seraphim. The cherubim were high-order angels, created by God to be his servants, but who aligned themselves with Lucifer. Timothy looks to me. The war began when Belial talked Lucifer into denying God in the first place. I'm pretty dumbfounded at this point, and look to the graves of my family for a moment. 
why does such a big shot from down below want to mess with me then? The amber you spoke of, it has enormous power. Power enough where if Belial got his hands on it, he'd be able to pull himself into this world, Timothy answers. Pull himself? Uh, newsflash, Timothy, he's already here. Timothy shakes his head slowly. Belial is only possessing a man now. That's why the first day he didn't just kill you and take the amber. The man he had possessed was still resisting him, still fighting. At that stage of early possession, a spirit cannot make someone do something they do not wish to do. It wasn't until the next day his will faltered and Belial gained full control. Still, even in full control, only a wisp of his power can get through that vessel. Timothy gives an odd smile to me. Belial, with the amber, would have brought himself into this world completely, and, as a full-powered cherubim, lay waste to everything. Now he beamed at me. So, Fred, you saved the world by keeping it from him. I looked away from Timothy, not knowing how to feel about that. It only cost my family's lives. Their souls are safe. And Belial's still out there. He's still going to screw with me, isn't he? I imagine he's not too pleased that you protected your family from him. He'll likely continue to torment you. Plan on doing anything about it? I glare at the graves. Or am I just going to get a spot next to Sandy here as my protection? Do you plan on asking? I turn and face him. Please, Timothy, just help me get rid of this thing. Don't ask me. Timothy turns away from me and starts walking away. Well, who the hell do I ask, then? I shout. Timothy ignores me and continues to walk away. I turn to face the graves again, and I get the hint. I look around and clear my throat. Hey, God, mind giving me a hand here? Chavez's hand is on my shoulder suddenly. Do you know how to ask, Fred? I shake my head and Chavez just smiles. I'll show you. He gets on his knees and starts. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil." I slowly get to my knees and repeat the prayer. Chavez whispers next to me, Now ask and end with Amen. Chavez then gets up and leaves. I'm still on my knees, feeling rather awkward, but I just continue. God, I, I know I'm a kind of a, a stranger these days, but I need help. This Belial guy, he, he's killed my family, and I need justice. Help me get rid of him. I hope that's enough, and then I finish. Amen. Suddenly, I hear a deep voice above me. Fred Mazzioni. I look up, seeing only the silhouette of a man figure above me. God? I'm suddenly pulled up onto my feet. I see several officers, as well as the detective who said my name. The guy looks like an off-season weightlifter who's been shoved into a detective's uniform. The black officer's head is bald, and his voice is deeper than I'm used to hearing. Never been called God before, but for you I may as well be. You're under arrest for suspected murder, arson, and conspiracy to commit insurance fraud. Great, I say out loud as they cuff me. Hey, watch it! As I'm led away from the graves of my family, I spot him, clad in his usual white duster and red tie, wearing the police badge again. The black detective yells at him. Hey, Ben, we got our caller. You were right. He did hang around here longer than everybody else. Belial smiles as he greets his fellow officer. Good work, then, he speaks in his false human voice. Didn't think it'd be hard. He left a boatload of evidence behind. He smiles at me. We're going to have fun with you. Thanks, God, I think to myself as I'm shoved into a squad car. I look out the window as I see the black detective walk away from Belial, and then Timothy comes out from behind a tree nearby. Timothy stares Belial down, and Belial turns to face him. 
they contrast each other oddly. Timothy in his black trench coat and Belial in white. Not the right matchup, I think. They say a few things to each other, though I can't really hear too well. Leave is what I can make out from Timothy. Belial seems to laugh, but I can't hear what he's saying. Watching his lips, it looks like he says mother at some point. Timothy seems to narrow his eyes and get serious. Kick his ass, Timothy, I think to myself as I watch with bated breath as the two square off in the graveyard. Timothy seems calm and collected. Belial is grinning ear to ear. I look back and forth between the two, and my heart skipped a beat with what happened next. Belial makes a sudden step towards Timothy in a rapid, jerking motion and then falls back to where he was. Timothy flinches, causing Belial to laugh before turning away and walking back to an unmarked car with the other detective. Ah, great, I think to myself. A guardian angel is a pansy. Part 5 of The Creepy Pasta Restoration When Weird Darkness Returns. The Chilling True Terror of the Black Eyed Kids, a monster compilation by G. Michael Vasey. The Black Eyed Kids are an urban legend of vast proportions. The stories of small children turning up on people's doorsteps all across the world, spreading fear and terror, have only increased over time. This compilation of G. Michael Vasey's books on this scary phenomena include new material and new true stories, as well as the complete texts of The Black Eyed Demons Are Coming and The Black Eyed Kids. Supernatural expert G. Michael Vasey carefully investigates this truly terrifying phenomenon using real-life encounters with these scary supernatural beings. The result is an unsettling and sometimes terrifying book that'll have you fearfully anticipating that knock at your door, late at night. Who and what are these mysterious visitors to the doorstep? Are they demons? Aliens? What do they want? Why do they need to enter your home? And what happens if they do? Small kids that ask to use your phone or for a ride, and yet those who encounter them are scared to death even before they notice their black eyes. The Chilling True Terror of the Black Eyed Kids, a monster compilation by G. Michael Vasey. Narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Part 5 I get pulled out of the squad car in my Sunday best and led into the police station. Fingerprinted? Great. Mugshot? Awesome. Pat down? Man, this day is going great. Started off by burying my family only to get arrested for their murders in the evening. The pat down is a bit odd. The officer who's doing it stops at my coat pocket doesn't pull anything out and just waves me by after removing my wallet. I'm finally plopped into an interview room. There's a little two-way mirror about two foot square, a table and three chairs, counting mine. I notice they're all bolted down, which makes sense as I'm sure they don't want folks going full Jerry Springer when being interrogated. I try to contemplate how I wound up here, thinking about where everything's been going and how. I think of a way I can maybe convince the detective who arrested me that his partner isn't who he seems. Could that work? I think of scenarios where, if he was convinced, what would happen? I know Belial can move objects. I saw that firsthand. Something tells me if I had not been handling highly sacred objects, he'd have been able to pull me, too. If I blew his cover, would he just kill us and everyone else in the place? Or worse, would he kill his partner, a la Darth Vader force choke, and spin another frame job on me? 
Should I even count Belial as a he, or should I just be using it? Despite all this, I'm feeling oddly calm when I see both of them walk into the room. The black detective sits down and clicks on a recording device which is embedded in the wall. So, Mr. Massioni, I'm Detective Aaron Brown. We just want to ask a few questions, and then we can all go about our day. I look to Belial, who's letting his partner do the talking for now. I'll be happy to answer them, but I'll say this much. I didn't murder my family. Detective Brown just nods and smiles. Of course. He looks down to a file folder, pulling out a piece of paper. So, the day of the events concerning your family's tragic demise, where were you? Belial is smiling wickedly. I was visiting a work site and then my office. I was looking for some equipment I'd left behind, I say plainly. I'm not entirely lying, after all. Hmm, this work site. How far away from your house was it? Detective Brown continued. Uh, about an hour, I say simply. And why in the middle of the night did you feel the need to check for this equipment? Why couldn't it wait until morning? I did not have a decent answer for this and I tried to think of something that would immediately put both Belial and Detective Brown at immediate odds with me. I wanted to try and survive this interview without being in jail, which seemed unlikely at this point. Well, your demon-possessed partner over there sent me off to get an unholy object, or else he was going to slaughter my entire family. Yeah, well, while truthful, that would probably would have made him think I'm just messing with him. Despite that being the truth, I decided to stick with my lie. I was afraid it might get stolen. It was pretty expensive. Well, that makes sense. What piece of equipment was it, if you don't mind me asking? Of all the cops in all the world, I get the one competent jerk that can smell bull from a mile away, don't I? Remember, folks, get your lie straight before you're in the hot seat. It was a uh, sandblaster, fairly large one. At least a couple grand for that thing, right? Wouldn't look too good on the old expense report if it went missing. The very accurate detective asked me. I nod, and I have a good idea where he's going with this line of questioning, but I'm hoping we don't go there. His job was on Monday and Tuesday, about two weeks ago, right? I nod. That's very interesting. Belial now interjects. Why is that interesting, Aaron? Detective Brown looks to me now. Feel free to explain why I find that interesting, Mr. Massioni. Because my schedule at the office didn't say I had a job that day, I admit, hoping some honesty can be appreciated. The detective bangs his pen on the table three times. We have a winner! He leans over to me, getting uncomfortably close over the table. Your usual crew also doesn't say you had a job. I say what I'm about to say, knowing I'm going to start treading some deep water, there was a job, but the client preferred to be non-public. Non-public. Detective Brown's playful smile fades quickly. You know, every time I get a prick like you, one of these I-can't-be-culpable-if-I-don't-know-what-happened jerks, you always have another word for it. Confidential. On the down low. Under the table. Discreet. Exclusive. But non-public. Well, that's a nice way of putting... My client's probably dealing with some criminal crap, and I don't want to know about it. The detective leans back in his chair. What do you say, Mr. Massioni? Am I in the ballpark? I'm quiet now, waiting. I glance to Belial and catch his grin. I'm starting to sweat, and there's nothing I can do to stop myself. We had some forensic accounting done on your business, Mr. Massioni. Pretty uh, preliminary stuff, you know? He leans over toward Belial. It should have gone under about a year ago, or at the very least, you should have fired someone. Belial now interjects. Now, dealing a few jobs under the table here and there is not a big deal, but hundred thousand bucks? That's a crap load extra stuffed into your accounts, Detective Brown says slyly. I look to Belial. That's not how much I have in my business, at least not in the bank. Timothy's case was the biggest score I had in months and this year the under-the-table stuff didn't come close to making up the difference. Not between all the expenses, equipment, and so on I had to pay. Did Belial do something? I literally have no idea what you're talking about. 
So, you don't know where payment of over 30 grand came from in the past month? Say the cash we found in an envelope with a thank you letter that wasn't on your books but was definitely a payment? Such a nice letter, too. Must have done him a hell of a favor. Admittedly, he had me there. With everything going the way it was, I never had time to properly handle the cash I got from Timothy's job. Normally, I'd make sure to put out a bonus or two, buy some equipment, pay off some bills, and always do it with the -the under-the-table cash. I suddenly had an epiphany. Because maybe Belial didn't do anything but crunch the numbers of what I had done that year. I did have two cleanups, but they weren't as high-profile but they did overpay. I'm sweating more as I think about whether or not I'm a good person after all. Here I am thinking about how my money laundering didn't go over so well, and I think the average kid dealing weed on the street corner could do a better job. That accounts for this year alone, and our guys are sifting through your books as we speak, and we can keep on finding gaps and payments and bills paid that never should be paid. Detective Brown cracks his knuckles, and somehow, I don't think your non-public clients would appreciate us digging through their dirty laundry. Might get ugly for you, especially if you're on the outside. That's the stick, and now this guy is going to give me a carrot. Of course, we could just skip all that, if you can tell me, honestly, what happened to your wife and kids, why the doorknobs were found removed and why the windows were nailed shut. I'm quiet while I think of a way out, but then I hear Belial's human voice. Aaron, why don't you step out, have a coffee? I'll turn that thing off and I'll have a word or two with him. Detective Brown looks to Belial. Ben, he clicks off the recorder. I can't have another charge against you for roughing somebody up during interrogation. Belial just nods. It's okay, Aaron. Just step out for a second. It'll be fine. Detective Brown stands up and leaves the room. I'm pretty sure about half of all of that was normal good cop, bad cop setup. But with Belial alone with me in the room, I'm pretty sure I got the good cop, satanic cop game played on me. Belial wheezes in his normal voice. That was dull and boring, wasn't it? He leans back in his chair. Do they still do the chair here, or just lethal injection? I narrow my eyes on him. Lethal injection is fun. A lot to go wrong. Malil's eyes are on me as he leans back, grinning. You can feel your heart and your lungs start to shut down sometimes. I adjust myself nervously in my seat, and suddenly feel something in my jacket pocket. My hand discreetly checks it while Belial leans back in his seat, looking to the ceiling lights. It's round, cold, and I feel a cap. I try to hide my excitement. It's the same type of bottle that Sandy and the kids drank. I wonder what it would do if I doused him with it. I also wonder how it even got into my pocket, but I'm much more concerned now with what to do now that it's here. You know, beheadings were technically more painless. He looks me in the eyes now. I miss beheadings. He moves his now healed left hand up to his temple, resting his head on his hand. I notice he's only sporting three of his black rings, and I remember how one crumbled away from touching my wife. Hangings, too. Nothing beats when the rope doesn't snap the neck and you're just left being strangled by the rope all while you piss and defecate yourself in front of a crowd. Now or never, I think, as I thumb the cap off the bottle in my pocket. Shut up! Malil's gaze shifts slightly. What if I don't, Red Fred? I remember what my mother used to say whenever she felt she was dealing with things possessed in the house. Normally it was a dryer on the fritz or a bird that somehow managed to get into the house but the phrase rang clearly in my head for some reason the second the bottle was open in my pocket. I hoped I wasn't going to look like a complete moron if this didn't work. I splashed the contents of the bottle on his hand first, then his face. I made sure to get every one of those rings covered in the water, too. While I did this, I shouted, "'In the name of Jesus Christ, get thee behind me!' 
Steam erupted from his rings, and he gasped suddenly in intense pain. He choked as he inhaled the rising steam from his hand. He stands up quickly and pressed himself against the wall and begins to flail as if he couldn't breathe. I kept splashing him and got a bit on myself in the process. I was a bit frantic at this point. I remember every time I saw an exorcism flick, and I start chanting, "'In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, leave this man!' interjected it with a few, the power of Christ compels you. If not for the apparently seizing man across from me, I looked ridiculous. Belial's wheezing, hacking, and coughing. His rings have broken and crumbled to the ground. I feel like I'm missing something serious in all this because he's still in front of me, his yellow eyes swirling and glaring at me. I can almost hear his voice in my head as if it's saying, when this wears off, I'm going to murder you. I'm pretty sure I'm just pissing him off right now, but he's definitely weakened. I look to the bottle, and I notice something's written on it. Is it a parable? I splash Belial one more time and read the bottle. Then I give my own grin to Belial and read the writing out loud. Most glorious Prince of Presence, Saint Enoch, the knower of secrets, heavenly scribe, the governor of the world, expel from this cursed flesh the fallen before me. After the words leave my lips, I feel dizzy. I'm not sure if that's because I just might have successfully cast out an all-powerful demon prince or because I'm being tackled by Detective Brown. Either way, when I hit the floor, I'm completely winded, not sure if I can even keep chanting. What the? What did you just do to my partner? Detective Brown shouts. From his point of view, things have gone far too south, far too fast. Maybe he did just get a cup of coffee and came back to see his partner being doused in what looked like acid from the bottle. Both of us are distracted. However, as the screams coming from Belial change pitch, suddenly they go higher, shrieking, and I watch his mouth open unnaturally wide as his head points upward, his back arching unnaturally, arms stiffening to his sides as he begins to shake. The form of a man crawls out of his opened mouth naked from the waist up. His eyes are yellow and black swirls of smoke, his form translucent, his brow is furrowed as long black hair seems to float over him as if he's underwater. His face, his body, his arms, hands, every part of him looks physically perfect as if some male fitness model just appeared out of this guy's mouth. His form grows. It fills the room, moving over the ceiling as I notice a pair of black wings appear to be on either side of him. They look like black flames. The flames rising from each wing seem to make the room hotter, and ash falls from the bottom of each. The wings are so large they fill the entire room and block off the exit. I'm suddenly hit with a strong scent of sulfur, and the shrieking from the physical body of Benjamin grows louder. Belial's left hand reaches out toward me, his teeth gritted. Fred! His voice hisses louder than I had heard it before, no longer a wheeze, a vile breath reaching me, and the detective makes me wretch. Not by you, you pathetic, sinful mortal! He yells, his voice bellowing and shaking the room. I will not be cast out by the likes of you! The room shakes even more, and his hand almost touches me. His finger appears to turn to smoke, and his hand grabs his chest, his wings wrapped around himself. Above him, there is a more terrifying sight. A spear pierces through him from above, again translucent, a massive hand holding the spear. The hand is black, clawed, and seems to be scaled like a lizard. A giant lizard head pushes down from the ceiling, white glowing eyes drowning out the light of the fluorescent bulbs in the room, and more contrasting black scales along its muzzle. I can make out a pair of horns near the back of its head, but they disappear into the ceiling. I hear an unearthly roar as the spear is pulled back and then thrust through Belial again, hitting him in the chest, right into where I assume a heart would be if the bastard had one. Belial screams once more. His voice shakes to my core. No! No! Do not send me back! At his last words, suddenly nothing but a black ball hovers over the mouth of Belial's previous host. I see the black lizard's face open its maw, and a white light douses the little ball over Belial's former body. 
Suddenly, all the air seems to be sucked out of the room, and I feel a massive pressure smash into me and knock me and the detective into the far wall as the black ball seemed to explode in bright white light. I hear nothing but ringing in my ear right after I hear glass shattering and the sounds of alarms blaring. Someone grabs me, hauling me out of the room. As I'm being shuffled out, dust and chaos all around me, I see Belial's body lying motionless on the floor, his partner shouting something or other to the other officers. The officer who has me keeps pulling me and rough-handling me. I feel weak, and I shield my eyes as I'm suddenly outside, then thrown into the back of a car. My ears barely stop ringing, and I think I have myself composed enough until the car starts up, speeding off, sirens blaring. I hear a Latin accent again from the front seat, that was amazing, Fred. Good job. I look up and see Chavez, wearing a police cap and uniform, giving me a thumbs up. Right before I pass out, I realize that the cop who gave me the pat-down must have been Chavez. He put the water into my pocket. I chuckle as I lose consciousness. I'm woken up by a knocking on the rear window. I groggily look up to see Chavez's smiling face on the other side now without the policeman's cap on. Fred, wake up, man, let's go. The door opens and I'm dragged out. Chavez gets me to my feet, but I feel weak and I can barely walk. You did great, Fred, you did. Hang on a little bit longer. I can't go on, and I fall to my knees. Everything is still spinning. St. Timothy, Chavez shouts, quickly. Before I know what's going on, I see Timothy rushing towards me, you have to heal his spirit, Chavez says. The exorcism took a toll on him. Jorge, I, I don't know how, I hear Timothy admit. Chavez grabs Timothy's hand and places it on my forehead. Ask your grandmother. Timothy then takes a breath, and suddenly I feel, well, better. I blink my eyes and start to get up off my knees. By the time I'm standing, I look to Timothy in front of me, still wearing his trench coat looking at his hand curiously. Chavez is thrilled. I told you, Belial's interference wasn't enough to weaken the gift passed on. Timothy nods, seemingly in shock, and then looks to me. You did well, Fred. I lean up against the car and look Timothy in the eyes. So you're not an angel? Timothy shakes his head. The Chavez protests. He is. Chavez smiles to me. But he's young still. He doesn't know his own strength, Fred. I look to Chavez, oddly. How do you know? Because I read, Fred. I read the Bible. He points to Timothy, grandson of Saint Dinah, daughter of Enoch. Timothy just nods. We can talk later, Chavez. I think Fred needs to know where he is. Chavez smiles and points to a two-story house. That's your new home. I look around. There seem to be a few homes, sprinkled here and there, but it looks like I'm in the middle of Midwestern nowhere. Timothy and Chavez make their way down the walkway toward the two-story home, and I follow. When Timothy gets to the door, he knocks three times. Fred's here, Timothy says as he knocks. The door opens, and I see Sandy's smiling face. I run past Chavez and Timothy, and I hug and kiss her for what feels like too short a time, right up until I get a firm punch to the shoulder. Timothy and Chavez both wince. Never take a job like this again, she says. We were scared half to death. She takes a deep breath. Also, we're going to start going to church, like a lot. I thought you were dead, you and the boys, I said softly. Suddenly, Sandy's glaring at Timothy. Oh, you did, did you? She charges at Timothy and proceeds to hammer his shoulder a few times punctuating each hit with a word. Timothy, how dare you do that to him? Timothy gasps in pain. I'm sorry, Sandy. She turns around sharply and walks back inside. The boys are playing video games right now, and they won't shut up about how the internet sucks. Now get in here while I try and figure out dinner. I hear a litany of other complaints from her, from the stove to the refrigerator and the like which is typical of her. I walk inside. 
relieved to find my wife safe and still slightly crazy, and greet my two boys. For the first time in weeks, I feel happy and free. After dinner, where my boys challenged Chavez to a round of some first-person shooter, I see Timothy in the backyard, looking out over more than an acre of property, apparently mine, the sun setting in the distance. I walk toward him, looking him over. So how old are you? Twenty-five, Timothy says. Have fifteen years on you, I say plainly. Timothy nods. How exactly are you an angel? Timothy shakes his head. I'm hardly an angel. Certainly not a saint like Jorge keeps calling me. So what are you, then? At best, half-angel, half he looks far away into the sky, monster. I care to elaborate. I'm done being in the dark. So we're breaking the no questions asked policy. He smiles as he turns to me. I nod. Yeah, because I won't be doing that anymore. I shudder. I was worried enough about the cops finding out about what I did. I take a deep breath. I guess I didn't realize what else was just as interested. Timothy just chuckles. To answer your question, I'm the grandson of Dinah, or Enoch, who is the daughter to Enoch, of course, known as the Metatron, the voice of God. Enoch. That's the guy I shouted about in front of Belial. Timothy nods. Most exorcisms don't go that well. Part one is getting the name of the spirit infesting the body. Part two is ensuring you have the correct angel to get the job done. Most possessions, you could invoke Michael, the archangel, and they'll go screaming because Michael's the commander of God's army. Half the time, Michael will actually delegate the task to a lesser angel, but that depends on the individual's faith and resolve. That can drive out most lesser demons. For Belial, we needed bigger guns, but a stronger resolve. That's why we needed you, seeking justice and retribution. Otherwise, you may have died." Timothy frowned to me. It's why I had to make you believe Belial had killed your family. It was hard, as I can't lie. I try to let that sink in. So you can't lie? At all? As a descendant of Enoch, it's kind of in my blood. I mean, someone who speaks for God has to lack the ability to lie, of course. I try to think of a time when Timothy lied to me. But while he withheld information, he never did lie. My family's souls were safe, that was true, and he didn't even lie about the blood or how long it was there. Also explains why he was horrible at haggling. That means you talk to God. The Metatron speaks for God, right? Timothy sighs and shakes his head. My mother was stolen from Dinah when she was a child, stolen by none other than Belial. He corrupted her, filled her with hatred and despair. She had me with a, let's just say, a mass murderer, a fallen prophet, one of the people who destroyed the temple we had to restore, actually. So, that's the monster half? I ask. Yes. Timothy placed his hands in his pockets. My mother left me alone with my father, so I never learned what she knew. I'd never even met her. He takes a deep breath. One day I ran away from him and found the entrance to the Guardian Temple. The only thing that comes naturally is my ability to do this, he said, with an outstretched hand as a pair of doors opened in the yard out of nowhere. I look, and inside, now well lit, is the room I was so used to working in but had no desire to ever visit again. I used its gates to come to this world, joined the military, rose up the ranks, and gained influence. Because I'm going to fight my father. He looks to me. I'm going to stop him and his sister from destroying another world. To do that, I needed a base. I did my best alone, but I needed help to fix the temple up. So you called me. Timothy nods again. I didn't lie about how I heard of you. Everything else is settled. How did you save my family? I thought they were dead. I saw bodies. Timothy laughs. I got your message. When I did, I realized the mistake I made, that I didn't know where you were or that you had a family. 
but you should thank Chavez. He knew where your address was. From there, I was able to will the gates to open. I had just opened them in the basement and found your family there. Sandy's quite the smart woman, by the way. She had soaked towels and sheets and shoved them under the doors, windows, and was doing her best to hide under a soaked blanket. She was shocked to see a pair of doors appear out of nowhere, but she ran in regardless, taking the kids. He sighed. From there, I was able to substitute some corpses, and Chavez and I figured out a way for you to defeat Belial. I raised an eyebrow. Why couldn't you defeat him? Timothy's smile weakened as he looked at my new house. I was afraid. He kicks the dirt slightly, frustrated. Belial's manipulated my mother, stole her away from my grandmother, and nearly gotten his hands on something that could have handed him the world, all because of my miscalculations. He's older and more powerful than anything I'm likely to ever face or be. So it's like you thought in the car. Your guardian angel is kind of a <sighs> pansy. Like I thought, I said, bewildered. Mind reading is a simple trick, if you're part angel, apparently. Or why me, then? Honestly, Timothy said, some amusement in his voice, Belial, at his core, is a follower of Lucifer. Like his master, he's most vulnerable when he thinks he has won the day. So me thinking he killed my family and him tormenting me was him, what, what, boasting? Timothy nods. Pride comes before the fall, always. I shake my head. So I get why I helped, but you couldn't have called in reinforcements for a thing like Belial? Timothy's smile falls. Fred, I am the reinforcements. I felt my stomach fall a bit. What do you mean? Timothy looked to the temple entrance in front of us. Angels existed on this plane because God needed them to perform his miracles. God, while omnipresent, is also omni-absent. The angels serve his desires, and he directs them from time to time. He looked to me. Think of it as every time God blinks, a few hundred years pass. He can only invoke his will directly from time to time, when directly called upon by someone of extremely strong faith. I looked to the temple doors again. So that temple, the guardian temple, where God's angels amassed to coordinate his will, chose prophets, create miracles, led by the Metatron. I recall the blood I had to clean up. So wait, you mean they're gone? murdered by what is in essence my aunt and father. I'm all that's left, and I'm trying to rebuild. So for now, we need to lean on the resolve and faith of mortals like you. He smiled at me. But now I don't feel so helpless. I feel like there's a chance, however small. Timothy looked at the opened gates with a faraway gaze. We're losing, however. I'm not sure how long it's going to take me to recover and get the upper hand. How long do you need? I ask, like I could do anything. Fifteen, maybe twenty years, oh, which reminds me I need to get back to work. Timothy gives out a sudden whistle. Chavez and I should go. We've caused you enough trouble. Chavez? Still? I laugh. What do you need him for? Timothy looks to my house again with a look of serenity as I see Chavez running out towards us with a plate with a slice of cake on it to show me what I can hopefully become. St. Timothy, I'm coming! Also, Mrs. Marciana made you a cake! Chavez shouts. Timothy narrows his eyes. I swear, Chavez, if it's angel food cake! Chavez just smiles broadly at the pun. I groan as Chavez hands over the cake to Timothy, who's also rolling his eyes, and they walk towards the door. Timothy stops before closing the doors, if you need me again, you have my number. The doors close and vanish into thin air. I hope I never see you again, I say out loud as I head into my new house. Up next, the conclusion to this creepypasta story, Restoration.
Will NASA help Scotland search for the Loch Ness Monster? Is it possible that time doesn't really exist? Can you find true love and marriage with a ghost? How can a pothole revive the dead? These are just some of the questions I have in my new YouTube series, Mind of Marler. It's full of the strange and macabre as you'd expect from my Weird Darkness podcast, but with an added twist of humor, satire, and absurdity. If you like comedy and creepiness, check out Mind of Marler on YouTube or visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Mind of Marler. Epilogue. Ten years later, and I work in restoration. On the weekends, my new crew and I check out churches in need of repair and, free of charge, work on restoring their stonework. We do it as charity. Nothing but the raw materials are paid for. Usually the priest takes up a collection via the old school plates or we get it done by crowdfunding websites. My new guy, Devin, is on the second floor of this church, overlooking the center aisle, checking out a stone pillar in bad shape. Brad, this thing can't be secured. We're going to have to get some temporary supports for the roof and literally rebuild it from the ground up. Knock out the old, bring in a new one, whole nine yards. The Padre's not going to be happy. Devin shouts down, he can pray for it to be fixed, but unless God sends Mason angels, it ain't happening. Ask and ye shall receive. The priest of the church apparently overheard us, and he walked towards me. Dare I ask? I'm sure that's expensive. I nod. I'll get a quote together for you and see what we can do, Father. He nods. And I'll call my insurance company after I pray to God to help me through the customer support robots. Priests all have terrible jokes, by the way. Something you learn when working in multiple churches. My tinnitus kicks in, which I've had for the past ten years. I wish it was the normal sort, where you hear a high-pitched ringing. It's not, though. It's a high-pitched scream. The sort I heard when Belial was cast out. I pull out some eardrops, which I keep in the same bottle Chavez gave me. The screaming stops pretty quickly. The priest looks at the bottle for a moment. Saint Enoch? Obscure. I laugh. It was a gift from a friend of mine, Timothy. The priest nods. Ah, that makes sense that he's named Timothy. I look to the priest oddly. Well, why does that make sense? The priest smiles at me. Well, my boy, Timothy means follower of God. I smile and nod. <laughs> yeah, that's him. One of the nuns runs up to us. Father, something's happening on the news in Jerusalem. The priest turns and follows her. I follow out of my newfound curiosity. We all head into a back room with a television in it. Two other nuns are inside, glued to the television. Looks like an overhead shot of destroyed streets, and the headline reads, Terror in the Holy Land. I see a little I-24 logo in the corner. Never heard of that channel before, personally. I'm sure it's just hyperbole, sisters, the priest starts. The camera pans down to a group of five people. Three of the group look like they're wearing a uniform of some sort. Two are women, both blonde. The man is bald. They're wearing white, long sleeves with black vests and matching black pants. Another man is seen next to them, and it's hard to make out what he is wearing. It's red and brown and black, and I swear he could be wearing a cape or something, short white hair on his head. The largest figure of the five looks like a massive man with long white hair braided down their left side, while the right side of their head seems to be shaved completely. The larger man wears what looks like white full-plate armor and a white cape with a blue accent inside of it. Suddenly, the bald guy cracks his fingers and fire spews forth from his hands like he has a flamethrower under each palm. One of the sisters watching screams and the priest tries to comfort her. The anchorman on the TV feed chimes in. It looks like they have some kind of advanced weapons systems, and it seems attack helicopters are being called in. Oh, my God! The camera shakily changes as the white figure is suddenly in the air and a pair of white wings have unfolded from behind. In an instant, suddenly something springs from the angel's back, 
lands in its hand and smashes into the helicopter, destroying it in an explosion of fire before the figure flaps their wings again, blasting the debris away and diving at the next helicopter, jabbing the object that was pulled out into the helicopter closer to the camera. I lunge for the remote and hit the pause on the TV. Frozen on the screen, it's clearer to see it's not a man, but an absolute monster of a woman. In her hands is a massive sword, huge and bulky, and yet she seems to wield it without much effort. It looks like there is a blue Omega symbol on one of the shoulders of her white armor. I recall what happened to the helicopter as she swung at it, destroyed in a single blow. I remember the bloodstains of the temple as my hellish tinnitus kicks in again. I remember the gash in the floor as I spot the sword on the screen. Mike's voice echoing in my mind. This looks like one clean cut. The voice of the woman who Timothy was talking to in the temple behind the barricade, and I remember what she said over the sound of machinery. It was her, wasn't it? The daughter of Lucifer. One of the nuns asks, Is that an angel? My face goes pale as I realize who this is, what she can do, what she has done. She's here now, the people Timothy is trying to stop. I try to fathom if Timothy has had enough time to get ready, if we have any hope at all. The priest suddenly starts to speak behind us all, and I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts, and I looked, and behold, he points at the screen ominously, his hand shaking, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and Hell followed with him. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me anytime with your questions or comments at darren at weirddarkness.com. Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N. And you can find the show on Facebook and Twitter, including the show's Weirdos Facebook group, on the contact social page at weirddarkness.com. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. The Legend of Bloody Mary was written by Stephanie Almazen. First-hand Bloody Mary stories is from Audrey Webster. The Ship That Never Sank is from The Unredacted. A Veteran's Deal with a Demon is by Christopher Patrick. Kill the Dutchman was written by Troy Taylor and La Llorona, The Weeping Woman, was written by Gina DeMuro. The fictional story, The Creepypasta Restoration, was written by Jordan Eilbert. Again, you can find links to these stories in the show notes. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marler House Productions. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. 1 John 4, verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. And a final thought from Maya Angelou. We delight in the beauty of the butterfly, but rarely admit the changes it has gone through to achieve that beauty. I'm Darren Marlar. Thank you for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Hey Weirdos, be sure to click the like button and subscribe to this channel and click the notification bell so you don't miss future videos. I post videos seven days a week. And while you're at it, spread the darkness by sharing this video with someone you know who loves all things strange and macabre. If you want to listen to the podcast, you can find it at weirddarkness.com listen.